in place for a recommendation would be which in my opinion is not bad however they're in favor or against mm -hmm. and then with the final Okay, small so would they deny uh -huh. this? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Look, so maybe you care about the noise. He said. Uh -huh. I remember small would. Well, like, is anything going? Two people here. I guess so. Some, uh, three. Sound effects not good. Come on, come on before the storm. Good evening. Welcome everyone to the Durham Planning Commission. We're glad to have you here this evening. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and by the County Commission as an advisory board to the elected officials. So you should know that the elected officials on each case have the final say on the issues that are in front of us this evening. If you wish, uh, wish to speak on an agenda item tonight, we encourage you to come and sign up to my left. You'll see the table we have a sheet for each of the cases that are in front of us this evening. You can sign up to speak. When you are called to speak, we ask that you come to the podium on my right and please speak clearly into the microphone. We ask that you start by stating your name and your address, and then you will have time to, to address us with your thoughts and concerns. Each side, those that speak in favor and those that speak in against an item will have 10 minutes each. We can make adjustments depending on the interest on those issues, so we will, we will debate that as we get into each agenda item and we see how many folks have signed up to speak on each item. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. And again, we are an advisory board, so we will be discussing and voting on issues tonight, but our vote is not binding. It will then go to the City Council or the Board of County Commissioners, depending on who has the jurisdiction. Thank you very much. May I have the roll call, please? Commissioner Al Turk. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Uh, Commissioner Johnson has requested an excused absence. Commissioner Ghosh. Here. Commissioner Brine. Present. Commissioner Satterfield. Here. Commissioner Harris? Here. Commissioner Hyman? Present. Chair Busby? Present. Commissioner Miller? Present. Commissioner Ketchen? Commissioner Ketchen is also uh, requesting an excused absence. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Present. Commissioner Van? And Commissioner Van as well has requested an excused absence. Commissioner Gibbs? Present. And Commissioner Williams? Present. Great, thank you very much. We will now move to reviewing and approving the minutes and the consistency statements from our February 13th, 2018 meeting. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that we excuse Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner Van, and Commissioner Kitchen from tonight's meeting. Great, Second. thank you. Great, moved by Commissioner Harris, seconded by Commissioner Bryan. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Great. Motion passes. Great, thank you. 
We'll now move to approving the minutes and the consistency statement. Commissioner Bryan. On the first page, uh, item number four uh, on the motion, I believe that the commissioner who seconded that motion was Commissioner Harris. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other adjustments or corrections to the minutes or the consistency statements? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion for approval with the adjustment made by Commissioner Bryan. <laughs> Commissioner Hyman. Motion to approve the uh, minutes and consistency statement with corrections as presented. I'll second. second. Great. Moved by Commissioner Hyman, seconded by Commissioner Hornbuckle. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? Great. The motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to adjustments to the agenda. Ms. Smith. Good evening. Uh, Grace Smith with the City Planning Depart City County Planning Department. Um, staff would request that the agenda be adjusted so that item B under uh, public hearings for zoning map changes, that's um, 7B, be combined, the hearings for that be combined with the hearing for item 8A, which is the um, text amendment for the same. And we would recommend the hearings be combined, however, when you um, get ready to have a vote, you need to vote on the text amendment first. And staff will remind you in case that is an issue later. Thank you. Um, also, um, I would like to um, state for the record that the, all of the items have been um, advertised through legal and local ordinances and affidavits for such are on file in the planning department. One housekeeping item, um, the fire marshal's office representative is here tonight and he requests that we have no more people in the room than we have room for seats for. So the ones of you that are standing can stand for now, but if we get an influx of attendance, he would ask that everyone take a seat so that he can keep track of the room capacity. That's for everyone's safety, so um, please adhere to that, and he'll be making his rounds and checking on um, the capacity as the evening goes on, and that's all I have. Great, thank you very much. And there is seating over here to our left as well that's available for the public. Ms. Yeah, Commissioner Miller. Chair, if it's, oh, Mr. Chair, if it's appropriate and while it's on my mind, uh, I wanted to let the members of the commission know that I live within the 600-foot notice radius for the cases that are described in item 7 on our agenda and will have to be recused from that under the rules of the planning commission. Great. So at the appropriate time, we'll make a motion to approve your recusal. Um, Commissioner, Commissioner Harris? Chair, I move that we adopt the agenda as modified or adjusted by uh, Smith. Smith. And uh, MO4. Second. We properly moved and seconded <clears throat> to uh, make the adjustments to the agenda that were put forward by Ms. Smith. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. We will move forward with our first hearing. Yeah, this, yes, before Mr. Gosh. Before beginning this one, uh, I would ask that I be recused. Uh, my law firm represents the applicant on this next case, the Fayetteville commercial case. So move. Second. All those in favor of rec uh, approving recusal for Commissioner Gosh for the Fayetteville commercial hearing, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. The motion passes unanimously. We will move to our first case. This is Fayetteville Commercial. It's case A17-0016 and Z17-0041. And we will start with the staff report. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number A170016, Z170041. This is Fayetteville Commercial. <clears throat> the applicant is Patrick Biker from Morningstar. The property is located within the city's jurisdiction. The site is, is 2.86 acres. The request is a rezoning request from residential suburban 20 to commercial general with no development plan. The applicant is seeking all uses within the CG district. The applicant is also requesting a FLOM amendment, a future land use map amendment, 
from a low density residential to commercial. This map shows the aerial of the property. The 2.86 acre site contains a single family dwelling. <clears throat> it is located within the suburban tier. There are a variety of uses found within proximity to the site. The Lowe's Retail Center is located to the north across Martin Luther King Parkway. Opposite of the site of Fayetteville Road is the American Tobacco Trail. To the east of that is a self-storage facility with access off of Martin Luther King Parkway. To the south is property owned by Morning. Uh, to the south of the property owned by Morningstar is a church, and to the west of that is a vacant lot. The property is designated low density residential, which is shown in yellow on the future land use map um, on left. And on the right, the applicant is proposing to change the designation to commercial, which would be consistent with the rezoning request. And this map shows the context area. The applicant has submitted an application to change the zoning to commercial general which is shown on the right, and the existing zoning, which is RS-20 on the left. <clears throat> this request has been reviewed by staff and determined to be consistent with the requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance. This slide summarizes the Unified Development Ordinance requirements for the CG district. The minimum site area would be 20,000 square feet. The min minimum lot width is, 10, is um, 100 feet minimum Street yard and rear yard are both 25 feet. The maximum building coverage is 60% and the maximum building height is 50 feet. This slide summarizes the policies that the staff reviews when determining whether or not a property is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, and first one indicates that the slide, uh, that the uh, property is not consistent with the commercial existing FLOM. The applicant is, is um, seeking, I'm sorry, the, the existing low density residential, the applicant is seeking a change to commercial. They are consistent with 212C because the commercial designation is consistent with the intent of the suburban tier and it provides an opportunity for additional commercial land and employment. The proposed plan amendment is compatible with the existing development in the area, particularly because it serves an expansion to the commercial flom designation located to the north, <clears throat> and it is over one half mile from the nearest commercial core. There are existing infrastructure, such as roads, water, and sewer capacity, sufficient uh, to accommodate the um, site and the proposed impacts. While there's no development plan that has been submitted as part of this application, <clears throat> uh, the UDO does require project boundary buffers between commercial and residential zoning and land uses to allow for appropriate transitions. And any future development must account for those requirements. Uh, in addition, under the UDO section 7.3, there are design standards which would encourage a variety of building materials and treatments for non-residential buildings. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. At this point, we'll actually move to open the public hearing. And if I could get the, the list of those who have signed up to speak and as always, we'll start with those who have signed up to speak in favor of the proposal, and then we'll have equal time for those who have signed up to speak against. Thank you. All right, we're going to do our best here. I'm not sure everyone has put down if they're for or against, but we will start with Mr. Um, David Lister is signed up first to speak um, for with conditions. Yeah, actually, that's right. We will start with um, Patrick Biker. We'll start with Mr. Biker 
who is the applicant in this case. Chairman Bosby, my name is Patrick Biker. Uh, if I may, I'd like to have the longtime property owner, Yolanda Hall, speak first, and she'd be followed by Michael Palmer, who's representing UDI uh, uh, Industrial Park, our neighbor across the street. And then Mr. Don Moffitt is uh, also assisting on this, and then I'll wrap up very briefly. Uh, I may have to donate a couple minutes of my time to Mr. Moffitt, but I'll only speak for about a minute, sir. So if I could, I'd like to introduce Ms. Yolanda Hall to the commission this evening. That is fine, and, and for the record, all four of those speakers have signed up to speak. Good evening, Chair Busby, Vice Chair Hyman, and members of the Planning Commission. Giving honor to God for allowing my family to be here. My name is Yolanda Hall Long of 4510 Federal Road, Durham, North Carolina, and I'm here with my brother, Michael Hall. The parcel we are talking about this evening has been in our family now for five generations. My grandparents, the late William and Callie Jeffries, purchased 10 acres, which included this site. Over the years, this land was passed to different family members. Two parcels, now owned by the Morning Star Baptist Church, were once part of my family's land. My mother was instrumental in bringing that church to this area, passionately following in the footsteps of my grandparents, who had a founding hand in Community Baptist Church on Barbie Road. Our family has always been interested in community building, and this rezoning is no different. There once was a time when this land was home, but that was before Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway was our backyard. Ever since the city cut that road in, our property has been separated, so to speak, no longer an integrated piece within the fabric of the community. We speak tonight remembering our predecessors, their hard work, love for family, and for their hand in building our community. It has been a nearly 20-year journey for my family to figure out what to do with this property since Martin Luther King Parkway was built. My mother, the late Brenda Jeffries Hall, pleaded with the city to get assistance considering the condition in which the road projects left our property. She passed away in March 2001, and my brothers and I have continued where she began. Our very long, arduous journey has brought us before you tonight, requesting a favorable recommendation to City Council for this rezoning. Thank you very much. Michael Palmer, I live at 2804 Tavistock Drive. Um, as a, uh, and I will read a letter of support from the board of UDI for which I'm the uh, vice chair. It says, Dear Chair Busby, Vice Chair Hyman, members of the Planning Commission, with a mission to raise the economic welfare, education, and social levels of the low-income and underprivileged residents of Durham, our board has resolved to lend our endorsement to rezoning case Z170041 Fayetteville Commercial. After meeting in December with our neighbors, members of the Hall family, our board came to recognize the importance of the approval of this rezoning for a longtime Durham family. The Halls have owned this land since the 1940s and have seen it slowly depleted through various road improvements projects over the years. Situated at the corner of Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Parkway and Fairville Road, the site is well suited for commercial development. Without the rezoning, we fear that the Hall family land will continue to diminish in value and the Halls will not be allowed to realize any value from their family's long-term ownership. All too often, the barriers to entry in the rezoning process, especially the application and consulting fees, act as an, as an impediment to the landowners being able to achieve market value for their, for their real estate. We do not want to see that happen to the Halls, whose family contributions within our community served as building blocks for many. Moreover, as their neighbor, we genuinely are excited about the possibility of a new commercial tenant nearby. We gladly welcome a new commercial neighbor that will 
serve not only our needs, but those of the greater community, while also allowing this long-term Durham family to share in the economic prosperity which has touched so many in Durham. It is the sincere hope of UDI that this rezoning will be approved. Please vote to approve this rezoning. Sincerely, R. Is Stewart, President and CEO of UDI. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Busby, Vice Chair Hyman, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Don Moffat. I live at 2114 Wilson Street here in Durham. For those of you who I don't know, I served on the Planning Commission, this commission, for six years. I chaired it for three, and I served on the City Council for five years. I usually argue for a, a, strongly for a development plan. Okay, wait a minute. There we go. I usually argue strongly for a development plan, but on occasion I support a rezoning without requiring that a property owner go to the significant expense of creating one. This is one such site, and I want to share with you why I see it that way. This is the site in 1993 before Martin Luther King Parkway was constructed. Here's the site in 2004. You can see the parkway is now constructed. They lowered the roadway substantially, leaving the site essentially on a hill. I mean, it is on a hill. At this point, the family still had the ability, when they got to, uh, drove out of their driveway, to turn left or right on Fayetteville Parkway. In this photo from 2010, you can see that the newly built Lowe's, you can see the newly built Lowe's. As part of that development, they made several improvements to the roads, including a median in the middle of Fayetteville <coughs> so the family could no longer turn left out of their property. And then this photo in 217, you can see the medians, both along um, Fayetteville and along the parkway, so that all access points are only right in and right out. And there's, um, you, cannot, you can only access this if you're headed south on Fayetteville or east on Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway. So on the future land use map, um, you can see that um, there's a commercial, this is really well situated to be a commercial node, which is what the conference plan calls for. Um, you can see that the Lowe's area is commercial. There's out parcels there. There's a, a to the caddy corner to the northeast is another commercial er area on the future land use map. And then a large industrial area, um, which is mostly UDI. Let's see. So, this is, uh, okay, so the current conditions are is that Hanson Road and Turmeric Road, both right now, those are the, the bottom two blue <laughs> circles. They can turn left or right coming out the Fayetteville Road. Um, the site, though, as I mentioned, is a left, is a right turn in and a right turn out only. So there's a widening of Fayetteville Road and improvements that can be made to Martin Luther King, and the access near becomes even more difficult. So the extended median is going to force both Hanson and Turmeric to only turn right on the Fayetteville Road. The point that I want to make is that the uses of the site are already limited. That's one reason why you might have a development plan. Regardless of the zoning, it's got poor access. It's only going to get worse. There's um, a, a lot of different uses that would not come to this area simply because of the access issues. And while we're on this slide, I want to call your attention to the neighborhood to the west. Um, okay, there's no uh, mouse here. There's, uh, but the neighborhood to the west, um, along Hanson Road and Shady Side Lane, I'll show you a little bit about that in a moment. It's the only area which might possibly see impacts from any development on the site. In this case, you can see that the orientation is slightly turned, so the neighborhood is back to the right. And you can see that from the lows to the neighborhood, it's 785 feet. Um, to the site itself, it's an additional 500 feet further than the lows is. It's okay. That's fine. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. So in this orientation, we've shifted it slightly again. This is the site. I want to show you that there's a stream between the site and the neighborhood that we were talking about. And the stream, the topography, it's a 30-foot drop from the 
property line down to the stream. So there's effectively a 300 foot, it's an undesignated but very real buffer that's going to exist. And then let's take a look at the site. We, uh, as you know from the packet, it's 2.856 acres. But part of it's going to go into buffers. So there's a, a, a 30 foot buffer. It's going to, it's actually, a, I think it's a 40% opacity, but it requires 30 feet along the creek. Another 50 feet required between the uh, property and the adjacent church. So th between those two, three quarters of an acre will go into the buffers. And that reduces it to just over 2.8 acres, two, over two acres. But then there's also road widening projects that's gonna take this much land here. These are already funded and scheduled, and this is gonna take another quarter acre out. So you can see that they actually have less than two acres that's developable. Okay, sorry, Patrick. Uses then will be limited by the small size of the site as well as the access points. Great, thank you. Uh, you may have another moment to wrap, to wrap up. up. Chairman Busby, Vice Chair Hyman, members of the commission, Patrick Bike with Morningstar Law Group. I'm here tonight representing Yolanda and Michael Hall. You've already heard quite a bit, so I just want to wrap up briefly. I do view, view this rezoning as a straightforward case of restitution. It is simply unusable for this 2.8 acres to have RS20 zoning when it is at the intersection of two major thoroughfares. As Don noted, there's uh, homes, most of the long, homes along Hanson Road are closer to the Lowe's home improvement than they are to the Yolanda and Michael's property that you're looking at this evening. The f approximately $40,000 it would cost to do a development plan and a TIA is unreasonable given the access limitations and the natural buffering that are locked in today for this property. Durham City ordinances, including but not limited to the UDO, place limits on noise, height, and uh, lighting at this, at this site. These limitations provide sufficient neighborhood protection given the trees, topography, buffers, and access constraints that you've just heard about. And so for all these reasons, we respectfully ask for your recommendation of approval, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We have five additional speakers, three that, uh, that say they support with conditions and two that are against. We are going to have the five of you come up who, uh, who are, have concerns with this, and you will have 10 minutes for this side as well, and we'll grant an extra minute or two as we did for the proponents. Uh, our first speaker is David Lister. And then next will be Jesse Burwell. And then Barry Everett. We'll have the three of you come up first, please. Good evening, Commission. My name is David Lister. I live at 121 Fallenwood Avenue. I'm also on the uh, Hope Valley Farms North Homeowners Association. So I appreciate what you do, how you serve, and I serve, and I know sometimes it's kind of tough. We're like the X-Men, we serve people that hate and fear us. So with that, I would like them to be able to sell their property. I think it is only fair. But I do feel that there needs to be some conditions. I know when my wife and I were moving to the area and looking around, we would turn down homes that would have either a Wendy's on a corner or whatnot, because we wanted a feeling of community. The things that we would like to see in this area might be medical retail, a mixed-use building, family-style restaurant, a gourmet-style a bookstore, um, and something that's pedestrian-friendly. The things that the community is kind of against would be a fast food restaurant, a gas station, a mechanic, and a 24-hour zone. After talking to an officer today that goes around our community, he says with that road with MLK, it's tough because it divides District 4 and District 3. And if we have something that's 24 hours and whatnot, he calls it sort of like a no man's land. So one area can come in and it's, it's very difficult. We also saw as a community that in the past we fought a Walmart coming in and that kind of devalued our property. We had shoplifting, we had speeding through our area. And we would like to see businesses that enhance the community, that pull up the neighborhood, that make it so we are one. And with this time, I would like to share to you what comes from Gilio Gabron's the prophet. Then a mason came forth and said, speak to us of houses. And he answered and said, build of your imaginings a bower in the wilderness 
ere you build a house within the city walls. For even as you have homecomings in your twilight, so has the wander in you, the ever distant and alone. Your house is your larger body. It grows in the sun and sleeps in the stillness of the night. And it is not dreamless. Does not your house dream? In dreaming, leave the city for grove or hilltop. Would that I could gather your houses into my hand, and like a sower, scatter them in forest and meadow, where the valleys were your streets and the green paths your alleys, that you might seek one another through vineyards and come with the fragrance of the earth in your garments. But these things are not yet to be. I would like to see us remain green and promote fruit in vineyard and to not sanitize already a community with more cement. I would like to see children playing, playing cornhole or reading or being with each other or playing together. And I do think it is fair that they are able to sell their property, but I do think the others around the area should have their property enhanced as well. So I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Commission, good evening. My name is Jesse Burwell, and I reside at 718 Hanson Road in Durham, and I'm speaking on behalf of the older section of the Hanson Road uh, community. I'll try and be brief, and uh, this case is a proposal to rezone property at the corner of MLK Parkway and Fayetteville Road from residential to general commercial. My neighbors and I agree the property in question is not suitable for any type of residential housing. So we understand the reason why the property owner, Ms. Yolanda Hall Long, and, and her uh, lawyer want to request this rezoning of her property from uh, residential to commercial. Um, the concern of my neighbors and myself is this. A general commercial zoning is intended for general commercial uses. So if approved this way, there is no guarantee what would end up being there without any uh, attached conditions. What makes me feel a little better, and I wanted to mention it publicly, is that Ms. Hall Long and Mr. Biker have agreed uh, or express the willingness to both receive and pursue suggestions from the community on what types of commercial establishments would be most palatable to the surrounding communities. However, even with this, uh, we understand there's no guarantee of what would end up being there with a general commercial zoning. For the record, the old Hanson Road community would support certain types of uh, businesses at the proposed site, and I pass this information on to Mr. Biker. Uh, the old Hanson Road community would support commercialism on the proposed site, such as a daycare center, a professional office building like a dentist's office, a dry cleaner's drugstore, and grocery store. And since I gave Mr. Biker our list, I have received a little more input and in reference to a restaurant, mo more residents strongly prefer a sit-down restaurant and not a fast food restaurant with a drive-through. It's also important to note that no one I spoke with wanted a sheets or similar business there uh, that would maintain very late hours on a 24-7 basis and create through traffic uh, through our communities all, at all times of the day or night. Residents of the old Hanson Road community are asking simply to be kept abreast of what's going on. And if a general commercial zoning is recommended and ultimately approved by city council, we ask that a significant effort be made to get commercialism on that site that is palatable to a majority of residents in the surrounding communities. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Barry Everett? Yeah, I'm a terrified public speaker, so forgive me for reading. <laughs> Hello, commissioners, and thank you for the time. Uh, my name is Barry Everett, and I live at 812 Turmeric Lane in the community of Green Gardens. 
This is just two short blocks away from the proposed rezoning of the southwest corner of MLK Junior Parkway and Fayetteville Road from residential to general commercial. Uh, I would like to express a few concerns. My husband and I spent our retirement savings in 2003 to buy our home in Green Gardens because it was away from the concrete landscape of commercial development we had lived next to before. Now we see that commercial development chasing us. On the northwest corner of MLK and Fayetteville, where there was once nothing but a beautiful tree line, there is now a Lowe's home improvement and auto zone. Many of my neighbors share my concerns regarding the property two, blo two lots away from us being rezoned. We would not want to see it used for a Sheets gas station, as been mentioned, a 7-Eleven, or other businesses which are open late into the night. It would bring bright lights, noise pollution, which we already get from Lowe's uh, speakers, and even heavier traffic to an already overburdened Fayetteville Road. Possibly even an increase in crime with the influx of strangers into our area late at night. We realize Ms. Long has had difficulty selling her property and is thus desirous of rezoning. We wish to be supportive in a way if she would consider some conditions. After discussion, my neighbors and I agree that there are businesses which would be more amenable to us. These would include a dry cleaners, professional or medical office, bank, daycare center, bakery, bookstore, and many others. What they have in common is that they are not open late into the night. And we hope if this rezoning is approved that Ms. Long will take into consideration our hopes for conditions that will maintain the quality of life in our communities. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Everett. We have two more speakers to speak against, Michael Smallwood and Denise Hester. If you could both come up, please. Good evening, my name is Michael Smallwood. I live at 4611 Lemongrass Lane. I'm a policy analyst and attorney with the State Wildlife Resources Commission. I also serve on the HOA for the Bay Point HOA Association, which we encompass the lower end of Hanson, Tumeric, Lemongrass Lane, Shadyside, and a few other roads. Uh, naturally, we have a few concerns with this proposal. Uh, will it be an adverse impact on our neighborhood, on our residences? Increased foot traffic, commercial traffic, um, other issues, commercial parking, commercial traffic. Uh, overall, there's just so many unknowns, we don't really know how to feel about this. We aren't opposed to the commercial development or zoning of this parcel altogether, but as it currently stands, we are opposed without any limitations, without uh, further tax commitments. Um, throughout the staff report, there are several areas, no less than five, where it states that without a development plan, we, there's too many, there's unknown to move forward. We can't fully address the adverse impact, potential adverse impact. There's no TIA. Um, furthermore, if we allow the development under the commercial general tag, then we're opening it up to all sorts of developments, which could include uh, nightclubs, bars, even payday lenders. Um, additionally, while it appears good on paper, and while it does look as if it's a natural outgrowth of, a, of the northern commercial development, uh, a node development, really these separate areas between residential, light, industrial, and commercial are separated by the thoroughfares of Martin Luther King and Fayetteville. Uh, we don't feel any impact from the light industrial area or the commercial area they don't feel any impact from us. So really, and it really would be, if this is approved for commercial general use, it would be an incursion into this long-held residential area. Um, you may finish your comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, furthermore, the question is why now? Uh, 
there's still commercial lots available in the Lowe's development. Furthermore, the commercial area to the east of the Lowe's development is an undeveloped tract of land with just trees in which the uh, greenway passes through. Um, furthermore, down the road, we still have the underutilized old Walmart building. So for all these general reasons and the reasons there's too many unknowns to judge the potential public impact or benefit, we think we are opposed to the proposal as it stands without a development plan or tax commitments or those kinds of limitations. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Smallwood. Ms. Hester. Good evening. Um, I have two questions, if I could ask procedural questions before I begin. Uh, you may. Okay. First of all, um, are we commenting on the land amendment or on the rezoning? Or both? Both. Okay. Second, who actually is the applicant? Is it the Hall family or is it uh, a development company in Fuquay Varina? Well, if I understand it correctly, and I should, I should be corrected if I, if I don't get it correctly, I believe the Hall family is being represented by the Morningstar Law Group in this proceeding. No, no, there's a, on the, on the sheets, uh, in the staff report, there's a, um, there's a sheet for the developer and it's someone from Fuquay, I can't remember the name, from Fuquay Verena. And I know the property owner has to give their consent for rezoning to move forward. So I want to know who officially is the applicant. And that, why, why don't we have you speak? And that's a question that okay. I can guarantee you one of us will, will ask Mr. Biker to come back up during okay, the time clarify. of the commissioners. Thank you. All right. Good evening. Uh, thank you. My name is Denise Hester, 3526 Abercrombie Drive in Durham. And I live less than half a mile uh, from the proposed uh, development. And several years ago, um, this same parcel uh, came before the Planning Commission and the City Council um, for rezoning, and it was denied. Um, this time it's back, and we are sensitive to property owners being able to use their property as they see fit, but we have laws in place that govern or, or constrain some of the uses. Um, the, the thing I want to say, I guess, the, the strongest statement I can make is that there is no development plan. And as many have alluded to, the development plan has a lot of uses that are unwanted. But without a development plan, the residents are denied the ability to formally negotiate and negotiate proffers with the developer, whomever that turns out to be. And um, I think that's a serious oversight um, because people should be able to do that and actually have committed elements as part of the uh, action. And that is not possible without a development plan, as I understand it. Um, the other issue is that the CG uh, is the most extreme form of rezoning for commercial, and it allows, as people have said, all types of uses which we would not want, such as sheets, gas stations, nightclubs, firing ranges, bars, lounges, um, fast food, and without having the ability to proffer and negotiate, it's a wide open field should this property be rezoned. Um, it's a level of uncertainty uh, where that we know that development pressure, particularly this corridor and this intersection is heating up uh, quite rapidly. And I think everybody would like to see something that is an enhancement for the area. I'm not against the rezoning. I opposed it going to commercial at that time. That was before the Lowe's was built. And the Lowe's has a suburban character um, and a less intense use, which I believe I hear people saying that that's something that they would like to see on this parcel. Um, the other issue um, is transportation. Um, the staff report uh, or the developer's statement says that um, the city is planning, is that it? No. Oh, I can keep going? That's just one of life's little surprises. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you may continue. Oh, okay. Well, that the, that the, there were some traffic enhancements uh, due for the fall of 17. However, that's not the case. The city's own site says that there have been numerous delays due to land acquisition and due power negotiations, and that January 2020 is actually the new projected completion date for the Fayetteville Street uh, road improvements from Barbie Road, I think, to Riddle Road. So that should not be in the report. It's, it's misleading 
uh, the public to, to say that um, this whole transportation issue will be solved by that particular item. Also, there is no traffic impact analysis and the traffic generated from 48 to almost 2,500 trips a day, certainly I would think kicks this over into the area of needing a TIA or some type of detailed transportation analysis, which was not present with the application. The, the trans that's a horrible intersection right now. Uh, and I don't think anybody would deny that. So we would like to see something that doesn't add more of a burden to the people who are already uh, in the area. Uh, I think it is reasonable for residents to ask for a development plan outlining the applicant's vision, given the already congested nature of traffic in the area, the growth potential, and the accompanying development pressure throughout the corridor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just to clarify for the record, this is one of those situations where we're having a combined public hearing, and then we will have two votes. There'll be a vote on the future land use map amendment, and then a vote on the concurrent zoning. So we'll have two motions when we finish. Uh, at this point, we'll, I'll move to close the public comment period, and this is a time for the commissioners for questions, comments. Any commissioners who would like to speak? Commissioner Alturk, why don't you start? Thank you, Chair. Um, I have two questions for the applicant, and I'll, um, my first will be on behalf of Ms. Lester, uh, if you could just clarify the question that she had about that, the, the owner applicant. And then my second question would be whether, um, because there is no development plan and you cannot proffer any tax commitments, would you consider a different commercial designation, right, like a commercial na uh, neighborhood that is less uh, intensive? Uh, taking, taking that question first, I, I looked hard at that, uh, Commissioner, and the site is just, because it still has almost two acres of developable land, if it were one acre, I would have agreed that a commercial neighborhood zoning designation would be appropriate, but because it's almost two acres, that 5,000 square foot building limit is, um, uh, I thought, constrained the development, especially for something like a sit-down restaurant, which would have a bigger footprint than 5,000 could, off, could have a bigger footprint. That's why we did not choose commercial neighborhood. If it were a smaller site, we would have gone with that. But you, you think about it, 1.8 acres is almost 90,000 square feet. Um, you're limiting that in a 5,000 square foot building within a 90,000 square foot building envelope. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, the Fuquay Arena is simply a mailing address that, that Ms., uh, Ms. Hall has for um, uh, convenience sake. And just to address one of the comments, there is no developer in this case. There's just a property owner and our team that you've heard from who are, we have no developer, we have no end user. If we did, we probably would have a development plan, we'd be able to tell you what it is. But these folks have owned this property for 75 years. And um, what happens is an end user comes in and bargains them down on the price over and over and over. So after 75 years of ownership, they do not they do not get anything close to fair market value for a piece of property where they've had to put up with the hardships you saw in our PowerPoint. That's why we don't have a development plan in addition to the $40,000 price tag that I quoted for you. Point of reference is re referred to that this, that Yolanda tried to rezone the property 10 or so years ago. She tried that with a development plan. She flushed $30,000. That's pretty harsh. And then to ask her to do it again is, I think, a little uh, extreme given the limitations that we've seen in regards to access, the stream buffers, the um, uh, project boundary buffers, and the other limitations on this property. I hope that answered your question, sir. Yeah, thank you. Any additional questions, Commissioner? No, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bryan? Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Al Turk asked my question, so I'll move on to other things. First of all, in the staff report on page three, uh, paragraph E, I think there's a error on the uh, second line, and it talks about IL as an allowable yield land use category, and I think you mean CG. That's uh, correct. Thank you. And the other comment I want to make is, is it, I travel through this intersection quite a bit, and limited to right in and right out, 
I think there are going to be times a day when you might be able to get into this site very easily, but you're going to have trouble getting out. And I really think that's going to limit the interest in this site. Uh, I know the staff used a fast food restaurant as an example, but those are usually active uh, around rush hour, and I can't really see a fast food restaurant wanting to come here. Uh, and one other comment that was made about the vacant Walmart property. Last time I drove by that Walmart building, I think it had a Planet Fitness sign on it, so I think it's changed. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Commissioner Miller? So is there a way to show the, the overhead photo or the aerial photo? I want to understand a little bit more about how this creek works, and I know that Mr. Moffitt got a little rushed at the end of his presentation. Patrick, is the creek that runs back there, is that a jurisdictional stream, and does it have a mandatory boundary buffer? Yes, sir. It's a perennial stream. It's, so it's 100 feet? On both sides. On both sides. Yes, and that runs, can, can, if we can get the map up, can you show me where, where it runs to? It's right here, Commissioner Miller. Right and here. and that's not a piece of property that the applicant controlled. But that is correct. But that buffer takes up a lot of that neighboring parcel. That is correct. Um, in addition to that, we have the project boundary buffers on top of the hundred foot. So there's essentially three hundred feet of undisturbed forest land between Yolanda and Michael's property and the nearest residence, and that'll stay permanently forested. Three hundred feet. Is there any reason why there couldn't be a curb cut from this property onto MLK? I believe there could be a curb cut, but that would have to be reviewed as part of the site plan. So, uh, yeah, it's just, I don't know that I always know the rules about, because I believe MLK at that point, is that a state road or is that a city street? Hmm. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Oh, Mr. We, we may look to Mr. Judge to answer that question. Yeah. Uh, Bill Judge, transportation, that is a city street. So city street, so the city rules will control yes. whether or not there's a curb cut and its proximity to the intersection and those right. kinds of things. Yes. But it'll still be a right in, right out. It has to be. Yeah, it would have, yeah. and we'd have to coordinate with the, the TIP project, uh, the CIP project, rather, um, for the intersection. Right. Is there, and my last question for you, Patrick, is uh, I understand the argument that you have that w with a... Uh, 90,000, almost 90,000 square foot parcel, you, you wouldn't want to limit the, the building to 5,000 square feet. Is there any reason why this parcel couldn't be subdivided so that you could have two CN parcels here, each with its own 5,000 square foot building? Theoretically, you could, but then, you know, we are trying to uh, recruit restaurants to this location, and a lot of restaurants are over 5,000 square feet if they're going to have a large sit-down area. I understand that, but I, I, I think the commission has also heard from the opponents on the concern about a development plan, and, and, and the equities are, are, are obvious, and we, we heard those too. But it seems to me that if it was CN, you wouldn't need a development plan because the limitations on CN would make the businesses that went into this site uh, the, the more restricted uh, rather than uh, CG, which could allow a lot of the things that these people say they're concerned about, and, and I think those are legitimate concerns. I don't disagree with you on, on most of those points, but at the end of the day, we felt that the fair market value would be better realized if the building, it could be a perfectly harmonious use, but to limit the building size to 5,000 square feet would be a significant impediment for the free market to, to look at this site. Given what Commissioner Bryan just referred to, we have to attract something that's going to be comfortable with a right in, right out access. So I don't think it can attract a high traffic user like a fast food restaurant. And once you say that type of use is less likely, the ones that are more likely to come here are going to have a larger footprint. And so, and my very last question is. So with this right in, right out limitation on both sides, is there any possibility that people who get into this parcel and then want to get out but head west on Martin Luther King, are they going to turn onto turmeric and follow it all the way around through the neighborhood to, to find a left-hand turn out at, at 
Bay Point? It, it's certainly possible, or they could turn down to uh, go down. Well, the way the roads laid out today, they could. It would be more efficient to turn through United and Industry. That would be a lot faster to get around to Martin Luther King Parkway, heading back towards Hope Valley. Yeah, but that's counterintuitive for people who you don't turn east to go west, faster. even if it makes sense from the map. Um, I hear uh, you, but it's faster. Uh, it it would be faster, but it would it would worry me. Um, I know that I, uh, members of the commission, I would feel better if this was CN without a development plan or CG with a development plan. I understand the arguments that work against it. Um, I have to say I was not expecting there to be so much opposition tonight as there is, and I have to say that I have heard what the what the opponents say, and I'm, I share some of their concerns. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Commissioner Williams. Yes, um, I have concerns as well as it relates to the protection of those that live on Hanson and the impacts of a general commercial designation for uh, rezoning as the impacts of this would be almost tragic. And I say that because we have a conversation about the diminished capacity of the actual site at grossly over two acres where just up the road off of Fayetteville, there's 1.86 acres that is currently for sale for $225,000, which I don't know what they're gonna develop there either and is grossly becoming a commercial um, zoning site. But I just, I have huge questions about the impact because a general zoning will it may increase the ability for a quick sale to a developer, but it may not. And I can't say that fast food would necessarily benefit from there because you have a Bojangles that is right across the street, a Zaxby's down the street, and a Wendy's, and plus a, another strip mall. So I think finding a way that benefits both the seller as well as the residents will probably get this more favorable, at least from my standpoint, because first and foremost, I am concerned about the residents. Um, grew up in that area, so people will cut through a neighborhood to avoid traffic, and that's what is going to happen if this is commercial general, whether it doesn't matter what's put there. So how we address that is my concern. So how do we go about it? If we're not going to provide a possible turn in off of MLK, where you could turn in and turn back on to MLK to avoid the traffic of Fayetteville, regardless of the time of day, and with the proposed expansion of MLK and the traffic impacts that are going to be increased, there is going to be a stressor, whether it's residential or commercial. So, Well, to address to piggyback a little bit on Commissioner Miller's comment, there'd be no distinction on CN on fast food with drive-throughs. Many of the fast food with drive-throughs around town are zoned CN. So that wouldn't have an impact on that particular use, which would probably be the highest traffic generator. Um, we certainly will petition for an access point onto MLK Parkway to alleviate that. And I think any development at this site would have to request that. And I believe that with the proper layout, it would be it would be feasible in order to differentiate the traffic from people who want to use MLK versus people who want to use Fayetteville. I think that that particular um, address or the ability to address that instance would help your cause. Um, I understand having grown up out there um, 40 years. That was a staple. Like, I recognize that one solitary house amongst everything else. So I'm surprised that it has survived this long. But I think that even with the rezoning, you're going to face the same hurdles of being able to actually sell the property unless there's something up front that's already been motioned or offered to you. But definitely encourage you to try to go forward with a plan that is receptive. Any additional comments or questions? We have uh, Commissioner Hyman and then Commissioner Gibbs. Um, I would just like for to make a comment. Um, 
I think we all agree, and, and Mr. Biker, um, you can continue if there's a question in here. The existing, I think everybody agreed that the existing zoning is inappropriate. It is residential suburban. And it's just not, it's not a good fit for that area and something uh, needs to be done. We also agree that, you know, it's not cost effective to do a development plan for all. And um, uh, that is better suited for commercial. Um, granted, you know, it's, it, it's always difficult to make a decision when you're not looking at the site plan, but in some cases, um, I think that it's best to move forward with what seems to be appropriate for the area. It's a lot of commercial in the area. Uh, this particular piece of property um, can't, you know, there, I know a lot of things have been suggested as far as possibilities for the, you know, for the space, but uh, at the end of the day, when you look at that piece of property, um, there are not a lot of things that are gonna fit there, so which you know, which eliminates a lot of the arguments. So I think that we have to not lose sight of the fact that the existing zoning is residential, suburban, and it needs to be changed. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. Thank you, Commissioner Hyman. That that answers one of my questions. Uh, is there a structure on this property now? I, my eyes won't magnify this. It looks like either a house or yes. a something or other. A house. Is it occupied? Yes. How do they get in and out? Ma'am, if you're speaking, if you don't mind coming to the microphone, please. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, it had been closed up for many years. Um, I have an older brother with a disability. And since the bus passes by there, sometimes it was easier for him to be able to just catch the bus from there as opposed to me if I was not in town to get him to where he needed to go. The structure is uh, the house built by my grandparents um, that's sitting up there. And yeah, most people don't realize it's still sitting up there. It's been there for a lot of years. It's pretty much, it's been allowed to languish, simply languish. Um, and that's really all I can say at this point, that that's what's happened. Okay, well, that answers that question, too. And uh, uh, I think you have a pretty difficult time in getting a curb cut to make a left turn either way on either street. Uh, it's got to be right. It's got to be right in, right out. Commissioner Gibbs on any e either side. There's never going to be a left turn out of this. Uh, yeah, and that's right. I, I thought that's what the curb cut was that was mentioned earlier. I, I would be inclined to say go ahead with trying to find a buyer uh, under this uh, new zoning. Uh, I imagine it's going to have to come back before the commission for approval, is that not right? No, it would just be a site plan approval. That would be approved by the planning department and the other departments that would look at it. And that would probably would require a traffic impact analysis that'd be reviewed by yeah. Mr. Judge and his team. I don't see any other way to develop this except sell it to somebody, right in, right out. Uh, I'm going to vote for this thing. Commissioner Gibbs, any additional comments or questions? Oh, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know Commissioner Miller had an additional question. I wanted to put a question to Ms. Hester and Mr. Burwell. Um, and maybe come around to the mic so the people who watch this on TV will know what you said. Um, then the question is the same for both of you. If this property were zoned neighborhood commercial without a development plan, would you support this rezoning? We would, the Old Hanson Road community would support it, but at the, at the end of the day, we want something there that's gonna be palatable to a majority of the neighbors. I, I don't know any simpler way to, to put it. There are some things that we do not want to see there 
and there's some things that we could live with. And as I said before, the landowner and uh, the lawyer, Mr. Biker, have said that they will work with us. So, and you understand that the neighborhood commercial zone allows, only allows us a smaller commercial building and a restricted list of, of potential uses as a, compared to the general commercial, which allows a lot more. Well, speaking for myself, without talking to my neighbors, I would support it. All right. And Ms. Hester, how would you feel about it if this application were for neighborhood commercial instead of general commercial? I am all for the citizens being able to use every avenue of input and participation for these types of public opinion, public uh, opinion sessions. And therefore, and I'm also uh, about a 30-year resident back in Durham since I grew up here, and I've seen many a thing go south, many a thing that was promised, but verbal means nothing, nothing whatsoever when it comes to these types of um, processes. Yeah, but back to my, my and question. To, okay, I had to preface that, and back to your question. I would support CN with a development plan. I would not be willing to move forward without a development plan, committed elements, and these committed elements can reflect the wishes, um, however people negotiate uh, for the types of uses, because the development plan can narrow down on the uses. That's right. Even more so, restricted more so than the ordinance, than the UDO. So um, put me in the skeptic column. And, <laughs> and I would want a development plan with any type of development in this city or county. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hester. Thank you, Mr. Burwell. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Commissioner Al-Turk. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this, this is a uh, tougher case, like Commissioner Miller said, than I thought it was going to be. Um, I am sympathetic to the neighbors that uh, there are some concerns about traffic and the kind of uses that this would uh, allow, but I, I think Commissioner Hyman is correct to say that, you know, this probably should not be zoned residential, and it, you know, and this is a part of a commercial node possibly, and it just, it, it would hamper the applicant quite a bit and, the, and, and Ms. Hall quite a bit, I think, if we push for a development plan. And so I'm, I'm inclined at this point to support it I, uh, with some hesitation, but thank you. Seeing no additional questions or comments, we have proven that we are a deliberative body. <laughs> and we will show that again on both of the, re the remaining cases, I predict. But at this point, I will entertain a motion for the, the first case. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I move that we send case A1700016, the um, comprehensive uh, plan change, forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Properly moved by Commissioner Miller and seconded by Commissioner Bryan. We will have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. Commissioner Satterfield? Yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Busby? Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle? Uh, yes. Miller, excuse me, Commissioner Miller. So sorry. Okay. I thought you'd finally figured out how to do that. Um, <laughs> no. Come back to me. No. Um, I'm going to vote no on this one. Okay. I'm sorry, Commissioner Hornbuckle? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay. The motion passes um, nine to one. And then, Mr. Chairman, if it's appropriate, I'll move case Z1700041, the zoning map change in this same case, forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Properly moved by Commissioner Miller and seconded by Commissioner uh, Hornbuckle. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Those opposed? Motion carries nine to one. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. We will move on to our next case. And as folks leave, there are seats opening up, so we encourage you to grab a seat. And for those of you in the lobby, you may come in. There are some seats now available. We will move to a zoning map change hearing for Rollingdale.
This is case Z17000, and we will start with the staff report. There's a lot of seats open down here in the front, just in case anyone's looking for a seat. Yeah, let's keep, let's see if we can reinforce that because I don't want people moving in the middle of a case. <clears throat> we encourage everyone to grab a seat and then we will start with the staff report for the Rollingdale case. Ms. Sanyak, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening. Jamie Sanyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number Z170040. This is the Rollingdale zoning map change request. The applicant is Landon Lovelace from Underfoot. This property is located within the city's jurisdiction. The site is 6.65 acres. The request is a change from residential suburban 20 to planned development residential 3.940. The proposed use is a townhouse development with up to 25 units. The site is located within the suburban tier and also located within the Cape Fear River Basin. This map shows an aerial of the property and the surrounding areas. The subject site is two properties highlighted in red. It's 602 and 606 um, NC Highway 54. The property is front on the east side of the highway, just north of the intersection with Tudor Place and across from Squirrel Hollow Lane. The site is heavily wooded. This is the existing conditions map. And you can see there's, um, you might not be able to see it, but there is an isolated wetland to the rear, which abuts a buffered stream that runs along the rear property boundary. Single-family residential is primary, the, primarily the use within the area. The Woodcroft resident, residential development is located directly to the east. Glendale Hills residential development is to the west. Whitney Park, Spring Hill, Audubon Lake, and Darby Glen residential developments are to the southeast. This is the future land use map. The property is designated low-density residential, which is four dwelling units per acre or less. And this designation is consistent with the rezoning request. The contacts map, which is the current slide, uh, shows the existing zoning on the left, which is highlighted in yellow, the RS20, and the proposed zoning on the right, shown in blue, Plan Development Residential 3.940. This request has been reviewed by staff and determined to be consistent with the requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance. The slide highlights the requested district, some of the standards. <clears throat> the density, again, is 3.940 units per acre. There would be a minimum street yard of 8 feet, a commitment of tree coverage of 20%, a required open space percentage of 16 Maximum pervious coverage shown on the development plan is 34%, and there would be a maximum building height of 35 feet. This is the um, development plan that shows the proposed conditions, um, in addition to some of the items that I mentioned on the previous slide. The access points are shown with arrow points. Um, the riparian buffer uh, is shown in a hatched line as well as a uh, one foot no build adjacent to that. In terms of summary of text commitments, I just wanted to highlight a few. The development will be a maximum of 25 townhouse units. There will be a bicycle lane provided along the east side of NC 54 Intersection improvements and turn lanes at Squirrel Hollow Lane and the entrance. Bus shelter and pad on the north side of NC 54. A payment of $500 per student to the Durham Public Schools. 
and associate, associated design and graphic commitments. Staff has determined that the proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plan in terms of being consistent with the low density residential FLOM and is consistent with policies 2.31B, 232A, 812H, 814D, and 11.1B. Staff has determined that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances. I'll be happy to any, answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. We will open the public hearing. We have two individuals signed up in support, the applicants, and four that are signed up uh, against. So we will start with the applicants, Landon Lovelace and Josh Swindell. You can come to the microphone, please. And we'll have 10 minutes for each side. Thank you, Jamie. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Commission. My name is Landon Lovelace. I'm with Underfoot Engineering. I represent uh, Josh Wendell with Rollingdale Investment, LLC, uh, the property owners. I wanted to run through a little bit on the site. Um, can we get the aerial back up on the screen? So as, J as Jamie mentioned, it's, uh, it's actually two parcels totaling 6.65 acres. It's about a mile and a half, a mile and three quarters, uh, northwest of South Point. Um, there is a jurisdictional stream that runs along the eastern property line. Portions of it are perennial, which would have a 100-foot buffer on either side, and then a portion of it is uh, intermittent, which would have a 50-foot buffer on either side. Um, <clears throat> in addition uh, to the stream buffers that are in place, there's uh, a 10-foot no-build setback on top of that. And as part of the PDR, we've also offered a 30-foot wide corridor along the southern property line that would be in tree save area. Um, though no uh, neighborhood meeting was required, we did hold a neighborhood meeting in October. Um, and had a pretty good turnout. I think there was probably 30 or 40 folks there. Uh, we've had uh, additional coordination with stakeholders and, and Durham staff since then. And many of the text and design commitments came out of those meetings and those conversations. Um, we've, we've also had uh, additional recent text and design commitments that we're willing to offer tonight that we would like to put in place um, with uh, subsequent approval prior to council action. I don't know if it's appropriate to list what those are right now. Uh, why don't we wait one moment, if, if you don't mind, and we can just check with the staff to make sure that, uh, the, has the staff been notified of these potential changes? They, they have not. It was, a, it was a yesterday and today discussion. Okay. You, you should be aware that if you, if you proffer new conditions tonight, uh, and if the staff is not able to um, you know, accept them as stated, then it will automatically result in a 60-day continuance. Okay. So just want to make sure you're aware of that. Continuance if staff's not able to take them the way they stated. And, and why don't we actually have the staff offer their clarification on, on the rules? Because my understanding is that's not necessarily automatic, but it, it is worth noting. Yeah, it depends on the type of condition. Right. So staff, if you can clarify our policy, please. So uh, typically, we do not accept proffers from the floor the night of the meeting. We vet those ahead of time. However, we there are a few that we will accept if they're fairly simple, straightforward. Um, I have no idea what you're what you're thinking right. of, but once we get there, um, you can certainly share those with us, and we can let you know if those are simple enough that they can be handled tonight or not. We typically go ahead and ask for a 60-day uh, deferral or to continuance when you proffer from the floor. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You may continue your comments, and you can also make a decision about what 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 you would like to do. Sure. Uh, outside of the additional uh, text and design commitments, we we just respectfully ask for your approval and a favorable recommendation to the council, um, and we're here to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swindell. Ed. I was prepared to share the proffers. Um, Yeah, 
Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to share the proffers that Mr. Loveless uh, spoke to. Uh, like he said, we had a meeting on October 19th with uh, the surrounding neighbors. Gotten some good input from that and also from Durham and the continued discussions that uh, myself, my partners, as the developers and builders of this site and this project, we felt that these were relatively simple and would help uh, quell some of the concerns that have been brought up. So uh, one of the, the concerns was um, the stormwater uh, dam slope, um, concern over erosion and also aesthetics of raw dirt. So we have no problems proffering to side that slope, any slope of the dam. Um, <clears throat> another concern was, you know, we see in town and communities a lot of monotony in design, especially garage doors. So we we're going to proffer to um, stagger facade and varied garage door style and color, uh, considering architectural theme and availability of doors. Um, another comment, no building shall be placed closer than 60 feet to the southern property line, the eastern property adjacent to the open space track for Woodcroft. Um, no townhome building shall be closer than 30 feet from another townhome building within the development to keep uh, spatial consistency with the single family homes contiguous to the project between buildings there. Um, any on site retaining wall shall be of a tan or brown earth tone color. And then any uh, foundation walls for basement units or any foundation walls exceeding 48 inches shall be uh, stone or brick veneered, no parging. Thank you. Any additional comments? So what, what we will do, we are in the middle of a public hearing. Uh, what I would ask is if you have that in writing, if you could share that with the staff while we invite up the, the folks who wish to testify against the project. And then when we come back, we'll ask for the staff's input in terms of their recommendation on, on how to proceed in terms of the level of proffers. So thank you. Thank you. Just one moment, please. So if you may, we will ask the following four individuals to come up and be prepared to speak. We may ask for the staff's input before then. Uh, we have, uh, and I apologize in advance, I can't read everyone's handwriting, uh, Erica Legum, Maria Gerlando, Vani Lyon, and Keith Boudreau. And you will have 10 minutes combined. She, she will need to uh, cede her time to you officially. You can, if your throat hurts, you may give a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, great, yes, you may. Great, you may please proceed, thank you. Hello, my name is Erica Legum. I'm a resident of 19 St. James Court and I'm directly impacted by this rezoning. <clears throat> my family and I moved here from the San Francisco Bay Area a little over a year ago. And over the 25 years that we lived in California, we watched our beautiful, livable cities become so congested and expensive that daily life became very difficult and unpleasant. We spent a year investigating all the cities in the nation to figure out where to relocate, and we chose Durham. We chose it because of its diversity, progressive spirit, and natural beauty. And we're not the only ones who feel like this. I've met so many transplants from all over the country that want to move to Durham. We wanted to live in South Durham because of its proximity to RTP for work, but we struggled to find a neighborhood in the area that wasn't devoid of trees and surrounded by concrete. When we found Woodcroft, it was quite literally a breath of fresh air. Woodcroft's mission statement is that it's a development that coexists in harmony with nature. Residents love Woodcroft and property values stay up. Houses sell quickly. People want to move here because it's unique. We're not opposed to growth. The place where we live is special and we want to make it accessible to more people, but we don't believe that we have to sacrifice our community values to do that. Everyone here and the many people that signed our petition care about the future of our city. We want it to grow and we want to welcome new residents who love it as much as we do and who become invested in making it even better. People become invested in their community when it has a distinctive identity that instills a sense of pride. That is what we need more of. 
thoughtful building that's sensitive to the area, not expensive cookie cutter development that doesn't cultivate what's already great about the space. You can stop. Talking. We invested in Woodcroft because it was carefully designed to capitalize on its wonderful natural settings. This rezoning and development proposal is not in keeping with the character of our community. The area is zoned for single family homes. The developers state that this rezone will set the tone for further expansion of the area. Well, the infrastructure is not in place for that type of expansion at this time. We deal with serious traffic on the 54 already and the Woodcraft Parkway expansion is not slated for completion until 2025. They want to build on the Third Fort Creek, which is already one of the city's dirtiest waterways. This will further imperil the watershed and be a significant flooding risk for our properties. They propose to keep only the absolute minimum of trees instead of working to incorporate our community's unique attributes. Growth isn't slowing down in Durham, it's increasing. And we need to make sure we are planning and building for growth where we want it and where it makes the most sense environmentally. Planning Commission, we support your commitment to our city. We appreciate the work you do in guiding the growth of Durham and enhancing our quality of life. Let's work together to grow in a way that makes our city an example for the rest of the nation. Thank you. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. Um, my statements are a bit disjointed because I included paragraphs from my neighbors, okay? My name is Maria Girlando. For the past 16 years, I have lived in 14 St. James Court, a street adjacent to Lot 606. Thank you for the opportunity to voice my concerns and that of my neighbors. I admire Durham's strategy for growth in the Durham Comprehensive Plan, but I feel that more investigation is necessary before accepting a rezoning change. Home values in our area have gone up by 5.8% in the past year. Individuals in homes bordering the properties on both sides will suffer economic damages because their homes will depreciate since the present Windermere style of backyard views of trees and wildlife will be replaced with the back of buildings, bright floors and lights, and cement parking lots that the slim buffer zone will fail to cover. The developer plans to raise out the trees in the lots the aesthetic value of trees can be measured directly in terms of the sale values added to the home. The developer noted that as future developments continue along Highway 54, this development will assist in setting the tone for future projects. This development is not the model envisioned in Durant's plan. Windermere is down a hill from the steep slope that is planned site, which has us very concerned about drainage and storm water and the potential for damage pollution the Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission recommends a five-foot bicycle lane. A less than optimal four-foot lane is planned instead, probably due to rezoning. South Durham riders deserve the safety provided by a five-foot lane. From the Durham's plan, we know that many of Durham's trees are soon reaching the end of their natural life and that Durham should address its potential through appropriate development, regulation, and streetscape standards. The developers request to raise 80% of the canopies not in tone with neighborhoods present zoning. The proposed rezoning will generate an estimated 193 vehicles per day. This part of Highway 54 has very poor sight distance and is known for speeding, something that has not escalated into a problem given the present zoning may soon. Approving the rezoning would increase traffic substantially and this may have repercussions. Lastly, a Durham resident in a similar position stated to you, we purchased home in good faith in this area, and now we're in a position where we, have, where we are forced to defend them. Unlike the development team, this is personal for us because this is all we have. Please consider voting no for this rezoning request. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Boudreau. Thank you. I'm Keith Boudreau. I live uh, at 19 St. James Court, and my home is directly affected by the proposed rezoning and development. I'm not against growth. The greater Durham area has seen some of the sharpest growth in the state. And Durham will continue to grow and change is inevitable. But we feel fortunate to live here and we want to see Durham grow into the most successful city it can be. Successful communities pay attention to where they put development, how it is arranged, and what it looks like. That's why we all love our neighborhood. Woodcroft is a unique development. <clears throat> 
It cultivates small town values while capitalizing on its distinctive assets, scenic beauty, architectural character, and the sense of community. That's why even though it's an older community, our property values stay up. All development is not created equal. Some development projects make a community a better place to live, work, and visit. Other development projects will not. The more a community does to protect and enhance its uniqueness, whether natural or architectural, the more people will want to seek it out. This project is at odds with our community's well thought out vision of the future. Uh, the intent of this rezoning is to allow the building of clustered structures, and in the words of the developers, this development will assist in setting the tone for future projects along the 54. And as you can see, as you saw uh, from the staff's map, which I, I wish I would have known I could have put digital files together, but uh, it's, I mean, it's completely surrounded by residential uh, suburban. So this... <clears throat> This compact neighborhood overlay in the center is not sensitive to the underlying land use of this area and the residents who now live there. Uh, the key issues I see are insufficient planning and effects of leveling and building on a slope that drains into the third Ford Creek watershed. The storm water uh, runoff has not been sufficiently addressed. And we asked the developers for more details and they said not to worry, the engineers would figure it out. Third Fork Creek uh, is already much polluted and is on the state's, yeah, is on the state's, uh, Oh, thank you. <clears throat> is on the state's list of impaired waterways. The runoff from the grading and replacement of the uh, woodland with impervious surface could further harm this already at-risk watershed. The uh, the 54 and uh, I have another. Um, these two pictures here are uh, pictures I recently took of a very congested 54. I don't know if it's necessary to put on screen, but uh, this is rush hour on the 54 every day. Um, it's terribly congested in the mornings and the evenings, and the uh, Woodcroft Parkway expansion isn't scheduled uh, for completion until 2025. The developers would like to rezone and <clears throat> the rezone to pave the way for further expansion, but we can barely manage the traffic at present. Uh, this area is served by two bus routes, the five and the 14, but how will people move to this development and have safe access to the bus stop? They, cross, they have to cross the street uh, without a light uh, to access that, um, the bus stop that they're going to provide. Woodcroft's mission statement is that it's a development uh, designed to coexist harmoniously with nature. This is a large part of what makes it unique and why we all love to live here. It's ne is it necessary or in any of our best interests to remove 80% of the forested area and leave only the mandatory minimum of trees? Uh, planners, we're not your adversaries. We are your allies. Uh, we are here because we care. Let's work together for the mutual benefit of our city. Problems like air pollution, water pollution, traffic congestion, and loss of green space will affect us all in the immediate and down the road. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this case? Seeing none, we will move to close the public comment period, and we will go back to staff for guidance on the, the proffers. Uh, staff, Jamie Sanyak with the Planning Department. Staff overall does not um, view the proffers in any negative way. Um, we would just like the opportunity to have additional time to review them. Um, there's some language regarding the stormwater that other groups may have to chime in on. So we are asking for a 30-day deferral as opposed to the 60-day. Continuance, rather. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. So I will open it for discussion with the commissioners, and I will note that it is appropriate to put forward a motion for a 30-day continuance if that is appropriate. It's also fine for us to have questions or discussion at this point as well. Uh, uh, Commissioner Ghosh, Commissioner Bryan, Commissioner Al-Turk. Yeah, thanks. I'm, maybe two part question for staff. Uh, I understand you want a 30-day continuance for these specific proffers. Are we considering these proffers as being given at this time, or would it be appropriate to ask the applicant uh, if they indeed intend to proffer these tonight? And I will say, I believe, uh, we'll let the staff clarify, I believe that the applicants have proffered these offers. Yeah, that's they what understood sure. the situation and they chose to, to proffer them, but did I understand that correctly? Again, Jamie Sunyak, th that's my understanding. These are the proffers that are on the table that have been suggested by the applicant. Understood. I see them nodding their heads, so. Okay, good, all right. So that's good question. I think everyone knows what we've, what we've done. 
Yeah. So I may have some more comments, but right, yeah, that was the initial question. If you want to go to some other commissioners. Great. Commissioner Bryan. I'm going to pass at the moment. Commissioner Alturk. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have two questions for staff. Uh, for Jamie, I the um, attachment one of the staff report. Um, I guess that's Woodcroft. What what is that zoning designation? This is the yellow, the light yellow. Yes, my apologies. The the map should have a legend, um, or the legend should clearly state that the uh, Woodcroft, which is to the west or to the east rather, should be RS10. Okay. That's the um, beige right. color. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And and so the RS10, if I remember correctly, the maximum units or acre or. Uh, Units per acre is four, four right? Correct. Okay. Um, all right, and then a, a question for uh, about traffic, maybe for Bill Judge, because um, that's another concern that has been brought up. So, um, if this is approved and it goes from residential twenty to PDR three point nine four. Your analysis shows that the impact would be 55 vehicles per day extra, right? Um, I guess my question is, and one of the things that has come up is that rush hour is uh, a problem on, at, on this road. So I'm, I'm curious, just can you estimate based on your vehicle traffic per day, how, much, how many vehicles will be traveling during rush hour? Oh, is yes, so we'll judge transportation. The, uh, the net increase of 55 would be in comparison to the existing zoning, right. not necessarily what the site's currently generating since it's mostly vacant. Right. Um, but typically for a single family house or even a town home, um, we can assume about one trip in the peak hour for each unit as generally a rule of thumb. Okay. So, so we're talking about potentially 25 extra trips per Correct. Day, 25 I guess. in the a.m. peak, 25 in the p.m. peak. Okay, thank you. Um, I, you know, I, um, I'm so back to my first kind of question about density. Um, it, it does seem to me, and I understand that townhomes are a little different than single-family homes in terms of the character, but um, in terms of density and in terms of how it kind of fits within the rest of the area, it seems to me like this density is relatively appropriate. It is 3.94. Um, the, there's an apartment complex a few parcels north of this, and I looked it up online, and that PDR is 3.65. So, um, I mean, it seems to me like Again, I, I think in terms of density, it's something that's not completely incompatible with the, the nearby parcels. Um, and in terms of traffic, I do understand that it would generate, you know, extra traffic, but it, at least by the numbers that we've gotten, it would still be under the, the maximum capacity of uh, North Carolina 54. So that, that's all my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hyman. Yes. Uh, my question is for the applicant. Um, if you could step forward. Um, when you were offering the uh, proffers, you were responding to uh, comments that had uh, been made at the community meeting. So your proffers were in response to, you know, some, some questions that had come up during those community <coughs> meetings. So what I would like to know, and any of the applicants who are objecting to, um, you know, to, to, to the project, did any of those offers respond to some of the concerns that you had? And if so, could you speak to that? First, those were in response to the meetings and some of the objections. That is correct. That is correct, ma'am. And those specific proffers were actually due to very more uh, recent conversations than the neighborhood meeting. Okay. And so I still would like to know from those individuals who were Basically, and yes, the lady who raised you could you could come forward to the mic. And this question is specifically to any of the individuals who spoke in right. against this proposal. To my knowledge, no one has had conversations with you recently, so I'm not sure what what those are re referring to. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Satterfield. Uh, yes. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, we have multiple proffers that uh, are before us. They're not in writing. Um, staff is making, making a recommendation that this be continued for 30 days. I'm not comfortable making a deter determination without all of the information before me. So I'd like to make a motion that we continue this for 30 days. Second. Oh. Great. Properly motioned and seconded. We can now continue debate on the motion that's on the floor before us. So folks that, that were about to make comments, if you have comments on the motion, Commissioner O'Brien. Oh. I have no comments on the motion. I did have a question for the opponents, if I may ask it. By order now, motion and approval. Right. Then I'll withdraw. Before we vote, thank you. I think before we vote, I did want to just clarify with staff on the motion that has been moved and seconded. So we believe that we can be back. This would be a continuance for 30 days. And we believe in 30 days, we would have these proffers that would be in writing in an updated packet in front of the planning commission. And that way that, that it, the neighbors that have concerns would be able to review the proffers in advance and be able to understand those and come speak again, if appropriate. That's correct. Great. Thank you. Can accommodate much. that. Great. Thank you. We, uh, Com Commissioner Ghosh, on the motion? Yeah. Before we vote on the, on the motion, I, I would, I, I think it's appropriate for us. I mean, Commissioner Bryan said he had some questions for the opponents, and they are not the applicant, and I hate to ask them to come back in 30 days to talk to us when they've taken their time to show up today. I do think it would be appropriate to allow Commissioner Bryan and anyone else that has uh, questions or comments that are directed towards the uh, opponents of this to, to have some time to do that in case uh, the, you know they're not able to come back in 30 days. I expect that the applicant will be back in 30 days. Right. That is fair. That is a, a proper side wingman motion has been accepted. <laughs> Commissioner Bryan, if you may. But that's not procedure. Right now, the motion is on the floor, and that's the matter that's before us. That is true. So now, we, if, we, if we are going to go this route, we can withdraw the motion and allow further discussion and place the motion back on the floor if, if someone who has offered the motion withdraws. In that case, I will withdraw the motion with the idea that I will reintroduce it after these uh, concerns are addressed. Great. Proper, properly moved and withdrawn. Commissioner Bryan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I had several comments, but I only want to ask one question. I'll save the comments for another time. In the uh, presentations by the opponents, I heard somebody mention petition. And I'd like to know a little bit more about the petition, how many people may have signed it, so forth. And please come to the microphone. And you're welcome. If it's a copy you can leave, you can certainly leave that for the record. Yeah, I will. Um, it, it was an online petition uh, started uh, three or four weeks ago. It's got almost 200 signatures. Um, and uh, that just, I think, I mean, it's it's, it's a brief uh, that, the, the front page of the petition, which you can review, um, just briefly goes over uh, our concerns. Uh, there's also, I think I'm going to bring this up because it's kind of in connection with the petition. There's a, an email group of about 50 of us uh, that I, I would not, if, if we don't have the 30 days, I would not feel super comfortable speaking on behalf of a lot of these people, uh, some of them direct, uh, directly affected like I am. Um, I'd want to take it back. Uh, these pro I'd want to talk about these proffers, so um, I'd be uncomfortable, like, you know, uh, making a decision based on new information right now for a lot of people. I take it then that this petition basically is against the rezoning. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, if we have time, you. I could that, read that, it That's loud. all yeah. I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> right. Where should I leave it, um, Mr. Busby? Uh, if, if you may, you may yeah, actually give it to Commissioner Alturk, and we'll, we'll all take a look as we continue to deliberate. Thank you. Right. Yep. Uh, Commissioner Williams? Um, I believe he was uh, before me. You just didn't see him. Go ahead. Okay, Commissioner Gibbs. Uh, I have a question for, uh, and I don't know who this should go to. Uh, uh, I guess the proffers, uh, the applicant. Uh, it has to do with the, the, uh, the runoff, the, the stormwater runoff into the creek. Uh, did you proffer a solution? I, th that just completely went over my head. I didn't even hear it. Uh, but I think it's something 
that should, I think it's a major part of this site and gives some guidance as to where uh, this, a major problem uh, is going to be addressed uh, so that we won't have to go, it'll give us something, <coughs> you and us something to think about before next time. Sure, so I think you have a question that, that probably requires a little bit of explanation beforehand. You're, you're asking about stormwater and whether or not it's a problem. I think that's, um, anytime we would go through a preliminary plat and then construction plans for the site, which is the required process through the city of Durham, we'd be required to meet all city of Durham and state of North Carolina and federal stormwater requirements that have to do with water quality, water quantity, what, what we can release off site and whatnot. Um, the proffer we made doesn't necessarily, that, that's a given, that's, a, that's a, something that has to be done regardless. Uh, the proffer that we were uh, offering is that uh, based on the site topography and running through preliminary design, we understand where uh, stormwater wants to be down at the bottom of a site, water runs down a hill. Um, we also understand that there's folks that are on St. James Court that would back up to that, um, even though there's... <clears throat> 150 or 160 feet of undisturbed buffer between any of those backyards and where the, the toe of slope of any possible dam would be for a pond. Um, I think a lot of times folks have um, take issue with looking at the back of a dam because if it's not stabilized properly, it can look not good. If it's just seeded and strawed and the grass doesn't grow properly, then you're looking at the back of a dam that really doesn't look well. So. Uh, by offering to sod it, that gives you immediate stabilization, which not only looks better, but also helps with uh, any potential erosion. Yeah, and I wasn't trying to put words in your mouth, but uh, a, a site like this can be uh, designed uh, to sort of mitigate runoff, uh, slow it down anyway. Uh, but I didn't know if I missed something. Uh, and that's all uh, m my question was about, uh, which I think is the major impact of this site. Uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. We actually have uh, staff did want to make a point before Commissioner Williams. Uh, Grace Smith of the Planning Department. Just one quick, quick clarification. The petition you have before you is a private opinion poll type petition. It's not a protest petition per, per law. I just wanted to make sure to clarify that for everyone. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Williams. Yes, um, as far as the site is concerned, I did have, um, I had a concern as far as you're going in and you're developing and the retention walls are pertinent and they are indeed helpful in putting sod down and it's also encouraging, but you're developing in a, a particular watershed type area. The runoff on Highway 54 is vast and the protection for the neighbors as you increase the water runoff with impervious surfaces. I was wondering why there's no mention or no consideration for a runoff pond on site to drain towards that to help with what your petition is for development. Sure, and, and that's a very good question. And I, I think, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the answer is that that's not an appropriate uh, design commitment at time of rezoning because that's something that's required per your UDO and per your standards. That goes without saying. It goes back to when we develop it. Um, this this happens to be a townhome development that is very low density. A typical townhome development is usually between eight and 12 units per acre. We're looking at four, and we're only at 34% impervious, where a typical for townhome is more in the 60 to 75% impervious. So we don't proffer a, a stormwater pond because that goes without saying it's part of the requirements that we would have to develop in the city of Durham that we meet. Uh, any of the post-development runoff has to be detained and treated back to pre-development standards. So right. that's, that goes, it, it, I think it's not specifically included because that's something that's intrinsic in your ordinance that's required at the time of site plan. Well, I think that because it wasn't said is the reason why you're meeting so much opposition. Well, <clears throat> that's, that's a good point. And we tried to explain that, I think, at, at the neighborhood meeting um, as, as best we could. And, Unfortunately, I think what was heard was, we'll give it to the engineer and they'll figure it out. And the answer is that at a rezoning, it's not an appropriate proffer because it's a requirement at time of site plan or construction plan. Okay, thank you. And, and any staff clarification? 
Yes, I, and I just wanted to reiter reiterate what the applicant just stated. The, the level of detail regarding um, topography uh, for the development plan is not a requirement. So, and, and for stormwater as well, those are issues that come up during the site plan. So um, while we will definitely take in and review and provide feedback regarding the proffer, it's not something that we typically look at and require under the development plan. Any additional questions? I just questions? wanted to make that clear in the event that it wasn't. Great, that's, that's great, thank you very much. Any additional questions or comments by the commissioners before I entertain a motion from Commissioner Satterfield? Commissioner Satterfield. Uh, yes, thank you. I want to make a motion to um, extend or con uh, for a continuance of 30 days, as I mentioned before, and that will allow um, the applicant to put the multiple proffers in writing and make it part of the formal application and an opportunity for staff to have input. And then we have details that we can respond to, ask questions about, and um, the community can also have input on. Sorry. I would, uh, yeah, I would second with the understanding that 30 days means our next regular meeting, whether that's 30 days from now. <laughs> that is correct. So properly moved and seconded uh, for a 30-day continuance on this case. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. So again, just so we're, we're clear, we will be back at our next regularly scheduled meeting with this case. And what will be posted online and will be available will include the proffers. And so we certainly hope if you're available to join us again, we'd love to have you join us. We will, uh, we will make sure we have a, an additional public hearing. For those of you that cannot join us again, we will certainly keep your comments in mind and we encourage you to be in touch if you're not able to join us again. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback on the proffers and any additional um, concerns that you might have. So thank you. We will move to our final item of the evening. And just to remind folks, at the very beginning of the meeting, we made an adjustment to the agenda. And so we have two, case, two hearings in front of us for the Old West Durham NPO. And we have done two things. We are combining those into one public hearing. And that will still allow everyone to speak, but will we'll save time and redundancy. And then, thank you. In addition, we switched the order of the votes uh, we will start with the text amendment, in a day. and that, that's TC1, and then we will have the zoning map change vote second, and that's to conform with existing law. Before we move to the staff report, I know Commissioner Miller had uh, wanted to speak, and uh, we'll see if others will speak as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I respectfully request to be uh, disqualified from the hearing in this case. Under our rules, uh, it's my understanding I should be disqualified. My home on Virginia Avenue is about 500 feet away from the uh, the boundary of the proposed NPO, and I and so uh, uh, under the, under those circumstances, I ask to be to, uh, disqualified. I move that Commissioner Miller be recused from this case. I second the motion with the observation that I don't think he's disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> so that is properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. And Commissioner Ghosh? Yeah. So thank you for the time, Chair Busby. Those of you who have been on the Planning Commission with me for a while, or even if you were paying attention earlier today, I often recuse myself from cases because of a conflict of interest due to the type of work that I do. Uh, this case is not as simple as others, and I've evaluated whether a conflict exists. My firm represented a property owner in this MPO related to matters about this MPO, but our engagement by that property owner was related to whether there was enough initial buy-in to move forward with the MPO. We have never <coughs> attended a public meeting or anything like that on behalf of the property owner. Uh, we never have tried to influence any of the provisions within the MPO for that property owner. We also no longer represent that property owner and have not done any work on the MPO since sometime last year. And finally, that property owner is not the applicant on this case. Ultimately, I have, with counsel from others, determined that there is no real conflict of interest. Put another way, Morningstar has nothing to gain or lose, depending on the outcome of this case, 
whether financial or otherwise. Nevertheless, I ask that I be recused from this matter simply because of the appearance of a conflict of interest. The integrity of this process outweighs my commitment to evaluate applications that come before the Planning Commission. But before a vote, I want to say that I am appalled with the manner in which my character has been called into question by certain members in this MPO community. I have never given anyone in the city of Durham or the county any reason to question my ethical values. I take the work that the Planning Commission does very seriously and have never done anything to jeopardize that. My law firm has represented applicants on several contentious cases, but I have never been subjected to what I have been with this case. And I think you all have probably seen some of that nastiness that this case has drummed up in the emails we have been receiving. It is a shame how this case has been so polarizing. I want to remind everyone in the audience, no matter the outcome of this case, you all are neighbors. I encourage you to conduct yourselves as such. Thank you for the time, Chair Busby, and I think we should have a motion on that recusal. Great, thank you, Commissioner Ghosh. Commissioner Hyman? Motion to recuse, Commissioner Ghosh. Second. Uh, properly moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, one, oppo one opposition? I oppose. Okay. Thank you. At this point, we will uh, start with the staff report. Thank you, Chair Busby. Matt Filter, uh, Senior Planner, City County Planning Department, uh, Project Manager for this case, TC8-00001 uh, and Z18-00002. Uh, I just want to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about for the next 10 or 15 minutes here. It is somewhat of a unique case, typical to the cases that you typically hear. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what an NPO is, uh, give you a little bit of background on Old West Durham, uh, the geography, and it relates to the NPO proposal. Talk very briefly about the NPO process, uh, high-level overview of the NPO content, provide a very brief summary of the, the staff determination. As I'm sure you saw in your packets, there's a very extensive level of detail in there. I obviously can't hit on all that, uh, but I think it will supplement what, we're, what, I'm, what I'm sharing with you tonight. So from a high level, what is an NPO? This is a, a special zoning overlay tool created in 2006 allows neighborhoods to essentially create custom zoning overlays for their neighborhood to protect from uh, what they determine to be incompatible development. I think it's important to know this is a resident-initiated process. Uh, planning department does not initiate this process or directed to do so. Uh, staff provides technical support. The overlay modifies aspects of base zoning, but it does not replace it. A uh, NPO is a map and a text amendment. It's important to also know that an NPO, as it relates to residential uses, cannot regulate architectural or building materials of single family or duplex homes. Uh, and at, lastly, it's, it's just different from a historic district. They're both zoning overlays. They have different processes, uh, different permitting uh, applications. There's no, for example, COA process with an NPO. Uh, Durham only has one NPO, that's Tuscaloosa Lakewood. So this is somewhat of a unique case uh, before you today. Uh, that was uh, approved by city council in 2008, so it's been about 10 years. There is a uh, NPO process that is outlined that we followed. Uh, initially, it kind of simplified, in a simplified way, breaks down into five steps. Uh, the neighborhood submits an application. Uh, in that application, they need to highlight uh, certain character elements, uh, possible regulatory items, supporting information. Uh, they should also include signatures of property owners in support of developing an NPO. Uh, we recommend 51%, but it is not required. Uh, the second step is the staff reviews that report or that uh, application to make sure that the approved criteria is met. There's a variety of criteria which is detailed in your staff reports, but for here, a uh, consistent character has to have an average age of 25 years in the structure, has to be larger than 15 acres, et cetera. Third step is that the JCCPC, it's the Joint City County Planning Committee. It's made up of three members of city council three members of the Board of County Commissioners, and typically the chair of the Planning Commission. Uh, they review these applications when we do get them. We do not get many, and they prioritize them. They take a look and they determine whether or not to recommend the Planning Department to begin work on them. We then add it, if, if directed to do so, to our work program, which is then reviewed by the City Council and Board of County Commissioners. Fourth step is that the neighborhood drafts the, the, develops the draft overlay themselves with support from the staff. Uh, this includes outreach, data collection, education, neighborhood meetings. Uh, the neighborhood drafts and refines the ordinance based upon uh, feedback. 
And then the last step, obviously, is approval and denial by the governing body, in this case, the city council, but first a review by the planning commission, which is what we're here tonight to discuss. When we talk about the Old West Durham NPO area, I just wanted to provide a couple of maps for context. Um, this is essentially, it doesn't quite go up to the, to the street, but it's Englewood in the north, doesn't quite go to Broad in the east, and then it's essentially Hillsborough that snakes along the south and up along the west. It's 428 parcels in this proposed NPO area. There are 295 unique property owners. Uh, the NPO proposal is focused on the residential blocks, not commercial areas. So you'll see a little donut cut out there that's actually Monuts, so it's kind of appropriate. <laughs> uh, the neighborhood is primarily uh, modest single family uh, and duplex homes on urban lots. I think the average lot size is about 7,500 square feet. And the boundary um, looks a little bit gerrymandered, but actually aligns pretty well to uh, zoning and future land use maps, which you'll see here in a moment. Um, so this is the zoning map. As you can see, 99% of the uh, of the project area is split between RU5 and RU52. The only difference between those being RU52 allows us duplex by right. RU52 in this case is the darker uh, beige, I guess is what you'd call it. There are a few commercial parcels that are uh, kind of leftovers um, from when there was rezoning uh, for the, uh, comp the compact design district to the south, um, but uh, they were included in this project area. This is the future land use map. Uh, you can see it is almost entirely medium density uh, residential. Again, there are a few holdovers uh, for when the city, um, and you all several years ago, adjusted the future land use map in the compact neighborhood tiers. So getting specifically to this case, uh, the Old West Durham Neighborhood Association uh, submitted the petition in 2014. On that petition were 86 unique, unique property owners representing 86 parcels. At that time, about 20, it was 29% uh, of the uh, project area and 21% of the parcels. While we are talking about these types of numbers, I did want to correct an item in the memorandum on page eight. There's a reference to individuals who have expressed opposition or exclusion in writing to the planning department by January 31st, 2018. The numbers are correct, the percentages are not, so I'm just updating them now for your information. It's 27 unique property owners representing 106 parcels, 9% of the project area, 25% of the parcels. Uh, it's also important to realize you'll probably hear um, different numbers being cited for different meetings and different petitions. Um, these are snapshots in time, not necessarily whip counts. There's not a kind of like pro column that the city maintains and an anti column that kind of updates every week. Uh, we have various snapshots in time and these are just one of them. Uh, part of the reason for the neighborhood application was the concern over demolition, larger infill homes, changing the fabric of the neighborhood, uh, a reduction in tree canopy, uh, over paving of the driveways, um, and there's uh, been roughly, I believe it's about 20 demolitions in the past decade. So how is the NPO developed? Um, it's important again to reiterate the Neighborhood Association and the Neighborhood Volunteers were the author. Uh, staff provides technical support, help them understand what's enforceable, what's not, what's legal, what's not. How do you take this idea and translate it into actual kind of ordinance text? Uh, making sure obviously it's uh, compliant with the comprehensive plan and other plans uh, where, where necessary. There's been a very uh, active uh, one-year public planning process, which I'm sure you all are aware of, at least at this point. Um, there's, there were, uh, based on estimates from the uh, Neighborhood Association, uh, 205 unique participants between January 1st of 2017 and January 1st of 2018. So there's been a lot of voices uh, in this process. Uh, there were three publicly noticed workshops at E.K. Poe Elementary School. Uh, there were 12, a different, excuse me, 12 additional events hosted by the Neighborhood Association. These are not kind of the typical public me meetings that you send notice letters out, but they were open to the public. You know, they put flyers up, listserv posts, things of that nature. And also a very robust listserv and online participation. Uh, we kind of did the best we could to take uh, three months of activity and put it into the packet for you if you're curious to see kind of the back and forth online, because that is an important mechanism for some in the neighborhood who are not able to attend particular meetings. Uh, there's been good support among those who have participated in the planning process, but I think a nuance there is there's been no clear demonstration of 51% of unique property owners. Uh, that's not required in this process, but that's something that the uh, opponents uh, feel is very important uh, to note. These are just some various photos from some of the workshops that have been held over the past year. 
Uh, the most active one was in November. I believe we had a little north of 100 people in attendance at that one. Now I want to talk about the actual substance of the NPO. Let me just get a drink of water real quick. Uh, it applies only to single family and duplex development. It focuses on uh, five topics. Uh, floor area ratio to uh, limit bulk, uh, height, lowering the structure heights in the neighborhood, uh, lots, standardizing lot dimensions, trees, re requiring a backyard tree, parking, reducing parking requirements, and preventing uh, what you could call overpaving. Uh, the FAR floor area ratio provision um, addressing bulk is by far the most discussed and most debated. Um, probably when you receive emails or comments, many of them do center around this one uh, in particular, although there are a variety of other concerns across the board. Uh, the proposal caps structure square footage relative to lot size. So a floor area ratio of 32.5%, for example, on a 7,500 square foot lot, which is the average lot uh, in Old West Durham, means you would be allowed under this proposal a maximum of 2,438 square feet. Now what's included in that is the following. It is the heated square footage of the primary structure added to the total square footage of an accessory structure requiring a permit. Take that together, you divide it by the lot size, and you get a number. Either you're below that number, you're at that number, you're above that number, and it allows you, it tells you whether or not you, uh, how much additional development you could do on your uh, residential parcel. So an example, uh, this is in the draft NPO, one I've used several times, but a 7,500 square foot lot contains a single family home with 1,450 heated square feet, as well as a 400 square foot unheated garage. Uh, the FAR of this lot is 1,450 for the house, 400 for the garage, divided by the lot size, gets you 24.7%. So in this scenario, um, because 32.5% is the, the cap, there's about 8% left under that cap for future development on that property. This is just giving you a sense of what the FARs in Old West Durham uh, currently are. Um, this, is great, this is broken down from smallest to largest by quartile. Uh, the red dot, dot across the, the, the way is 32.5%. So you can essentially think of the space between the top of these bars up to that dotted line as the additional qualifying development that could occur on each of these parcels. So in summary, topic one, um, current regulations, there is no limit on floor area presently if you're under the height cap and your setbacks are met. Presently, accessory dwelling units are capped at 30% of heated square footage of the primary structure. It's current regulations. Proposed regulations, limiting floor area to 32.5% of lot size with some of the caveats that you'll see um, uh, such as exempting basements. Uh, but it also increases the ADU cap to 50% of heated square footage of the primary structure, uh, but it is limiting that to a 700 square foot total, and this now counts towards the FAR. The second component, height. Current regulations say that height is measured by essentially taking the average of a pitch. So you have a roof like this, essentially taking the average, so it's the midpoint. There is no uh, apex height. Um, for the primary, you may continue your comments. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, the primary structure, the maximum height allowed at present in this neighborhood is 35 feet, but you could go up to 45 feet if you do a one-to-one -one setback. There's infill standards that limit you to not being more than 14 feet taller than the neighboring properties. For accessory structures, you can, that that still remains, but you cannot exceed 25 feet uh, when within five feet of the property line. So that's current. In comparing to proposed in the NPO, the NPO proposes a new height measurement, apex height, so it's essentially taking a look at the tallest point in addition to just that midpoint, kind of exempting chimneys and antennas, things like that. It sets a new primary structure height cap of 31 feet, that's that apex height, and it's reducing the, the uh, midpoint height uh, down to 26. So it was 35, now it's going down to 26, adding the 31% apex height. They're also setting a, proposing to set a new accessory structure height cap of 24 feet apex and 20% mid, or, sorry, 20 feet midpoint, and introducing a setback requirement of 10 feet if height of the accessory structure exceeds 16 feet. And I'm sure you have questions as to how these numbers were reached. I think the opponents would be 
the uh, perfect people dances, or the proponents, well, the opponents might as well, but uh, <laughs> the proponents would probably be the best to answer that, although staff would be certain and welcome to chime in in that conversation later. Uh, FYI, 85% of the homes in Old West Durham are single story, so in general, this proposal accommodates a two-story home and a one-and-a-half-story uh, accessory structure. This is the image just that's already included in the draft ordinance for your review. Third component, standardizing lot size sizes. Current regulations, there is no maximum lot area currently. Uh, minimum lot width varies somewhat based upon the type of project, type of use, uh, whether it's a large project or a small project, as well as the lot widths of the neighboring properties. Uh, flag lots are allowed. Proposed regulations try to streamline this a little bit. Uh, maximum lot area of 12,000 square feet. A minimum lot, lot width of 50 feet and prohibiting flag lots. Fourth component, requiring a backyard tree. Uh, the current regulation is that there's a street tree required for 40 feet of every street frontage in the neighborhood. Uh, there's no regulation on trees in the backyard. You can have a bunch, you can have none, there's no regulation. The proposal that the Neighborhood Association has put together says that they'd like to require a backyard canopy tree of two inches or greater in caliper to kind of uh, reinforce the existing tree canopy that's already there. Some of the new development is kind of scraping the entire lot and removing all the backyard trees to accommodate large accessory structures, uh, larger homes, uh, large parking pads, things of, of that nature. The last component is uh, reducing paving and off-street parking numbers. Current regulation says uh, that essentially the driveway, the paving can't exceed 25 feet in width unless shown on a plot plan. If you show on a plot plan, you can go wider. As it relates to uh, current off-street parking requirements, it's two per dwelling unit, uh, now zero per accessory dwelling unit. That's a change actually that was driven, um, that came from Old West Durham that we've now applied citywide. So that's an example of um, some leadership locally in the neighborhood where we thought that was a good idea. We applied it citywide, uh, but that's still in the ordinance. Proposed regulation establishes a maximum width of 12 feet, but allows an expansion of an additional 400 square feet out to 24 feet in width behind the front building line, and it reduces the off-street parking spaces to just one per dwelling unit. It's just important to note garages and, and uh, wide driveways are not common features in Old West, and so uh, reduction in these requirements is kind of less need for paving, less paving, there's this idea there might be more green space might assist with stormwater, things of that nature. And because you're requiring less parking, uh, you can kind of tighten up some of those um, paving standards. So this is just a summary of content. Um, reflect The NPO reflects years of grassroots public outreach and consensus building. There are a variety of positive and negative consequences which exist, uh, which are detailed in the staff report. And I'm certain that the opponents and, and proponents will share with you shortly. Um, the proposal attempts to balance new investment with some maintenance and preservation of what makes Old West Durham Old West Durham. Um, and relating to height and bulk, uh, the proposed caps do exceed the established built environment, the typical um, property. Uh, however, there are probably many cases where additions and new homes would be affected and limited under this proposed ordinance, and that's one of the trade-offs uh, the neighborhood has, has made here. Staff determination, uh, just for clarity for everyone in the room, staff does not recommend approval or, or denial of NPOs. Uh, we do find, based upon the comprehensive plan, that it's consistent um, with the authorization, the comprehensive plan for neighborhoods to create neighborhood protection overlays, as well as um, ensure that residential development is contextual and in fill capacity. So we just recommend to you tonight to receive the report, which you did, uh, hold a public hearing, and provide a recommendation to city council. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions if they're very technical in nature. I anticipate you probably have a lot of questions. Many may be answered by the proponents and opponents. Uh, so, of course, defer to you on how you'd like to proceed, but I'm happy to ask, answer questions if you feel it's appropriate. Great. Thank you, Mr. Filter. I think what, what would make the most sense would be for us to open the, the public hearing and just, uh, and then we'll have you available to answer, provide any clarification if we have any and to answer any questions that we might have. Again, just to remind everybody, if you weren't here earlier, we, the process from here forward is we will open the public hearing. We have a lot of folks who have signed up for and against. So we're gonna have to uh, extend the amount of time. Traditionally, we offer 10 minutes for the proponents and 10 minutes for the opponents. We have 14 people signed up in favor and 25 against. And so we offer equal time. So you may have to bear with us for a moment, and we will, though, work to extend the time available for everyone to be able to speak, if you would like to speak. 
Uh, you are also able to decide to not speak when your name is called. You can decline to speak or you can offer your time to someone else. But we will have that public comment period. You, uh, when you do speak, we ask you come to the microphone. Please state your name and your mailing address. And you, you uh, speak to us as the commissioners. And so we ask that you direct your comments to us. We ask that they are respectful comments, that it gives you the opportunity to talk about what you like or what you don't like about this specific proposal. At the end, we'll close the public comment period, the public hearing, and as you've seen before, then we'll open it up for commissioners to be able to ask questions. They may call one of you specifically back up to the microphone to help provide some clarification or maybe a question for staff or just talking amongst ourselves about what, what we're thinking or questions that we have. And then, as I said, at the end, we will have two motions on the two different issues. And then just a reminder, we are uh, advisory body only. So this is, regardless of our vote, whether it's a favorable or an unfavorable recommendation, this will then move forward to the governing body, which is the city council. And I believe, if, correct me if I'm wrong, staff, this is, will be a, usually it's a two cycle or a 60 day time frame from moving to us to the city council. Okay, great. So before we open the public hearing, we are gonna have to determine the appropriate amount of time, Commissioner Harris. Mr. Chair, if I'm in order, I would like to take a first step and allow each side 30 minutes, and then we have to adjust that we can, but I move that we extend the, the uh, period for each side to 30 minutes each, that'll give us an additional hour. Second. Properly moved and seconded. Any comments before we vote? Discussion on the item? Seeing none, all those in favor of offering 30 minutes of public hearing for those for and then 30 minutes for those against, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, staff? Staff has, uh, staff has one clarification. How do you propose to divvy the 30 minutes up? Very carefully. So, uh, <laughs> well, in running this clock, as you know, it has a mind of its own. It just goes off and we haven't even set it. So let, we would like to at least try attempt to get it correct. So right. if you could let us know how many to a minute, so we, a can minute that. we have 14 signed up to speak in favor and we have 25 who have signed up to speak against and it's worth noting that we we did say that we will give additional time if that is required but we do encourage you if if your comments are are um, redundant with what you've heard before or if you wish to give your time to the group as a whole you may do that what I will do is I will come I will call every person who was signed up and I will give you the opportunity to come and speak. Um, and so I think if, if it turns out we do need additional time, we will look to give that time. Commissioner Harris. Mr. Chair, it looked like the proponents have two minutes each. Yes. And the opponents have one minute each to be within your time frame. One other point of clarification, our clock does even minutes, so if you could just give us even minutes, we don't do like 2.25 or anything. No, I said two. No, if, two that's, if that's what you want, that's exactly what we're going to do. Yeah. Okay. And then if someone wants to defer their time to someone else, we'll try to pay attention, but if we miss that, will you let us know, please? Absolutely. Thank you all for, for working with us. Uh, we will, again, we start with the proponents. We will start with uh, Barb Wellenitz. And then we have Dan Welch after that. And so to help speed us up, I'm going to read a couple names at a time. And if you can come and line up, we would appreciate it. Uh, you saw earlier where the buzzer went off and we gave folks a little extra time. That's when we had four or five speakers. We have four, uh, 39 speakers. So we do ask that you work to keep your comments within the, the time limit available. Then we have Simeon Furman, Kathy Saylor, um, Bob Wellenin's job. Shelp and Bob Ashley, just so we can get a group lined up in advance. We can get some technical assistance to get started with the present. Uh, I think I think we'll we we need uh, the technical staff to help load up a presentation, please. That's an HDMI. Hey, get it. Do you want to do it? Okay. There's one power. 
more point on that. While we're getting this loaded up, does anyone else have a presentation that you're planning that, or need to get loaded? It would be good to identify that now in the interest of time. Okay. Why don't, uh, and what, what is your name, sir? Why don't we start with you, and we can have you then let us know who else is, who is prepared to speak with your group. You need to go forward. If, if you can, actually, while I load that up, if you, you could right. even write them down, and I can then call them in the order that you would prefer. I, I have it written down. That'd be great. Again, everyone will, who has signed up will be called and given the opportunity to speak. Uh, but we, we will have the, the time limits constrained. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, if I could make one more request, maybe to simplify things, actually. We have six speakers that are lined up to speak. Uh, some of them are like three minutes. Some of them are a minute or less. But between the six, if we could have 12 minutes, is that an appropriate request? I think that's two minutes each. That is fine. Thank you. Okay. But... Pay attention, because if one of you is running over, someone else is going to have to speed it up. Great. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, commissioners. I'm Barbara Wellenetz, and I live at 2612 West Knox Street. I am a member of the NPO Working Group and the first of six speakers who are um, jointly urging you to support passage of the NPO tonight. First, uh, let me ask our neighbors who have come tonight to uh, support the NPO to stand up. So noted. Thank you very much for coming out tonight and learning a civic lesson while we were going on. So in the interest of time, um, I will not read these driving issues, but these are the things that most um, concern neighbors and w which we spent a lot of time trying to address. So you, they're, they're all there and they're very much uh, in your packet. So. We'll go on from there. I want to talk today about how the MPO proposals were developed. Last spring, a group of 10 to 12 folks self-identified as a work group for the neighborhood board association. It included my husband and I, who bought our dream home here um, eight years ago. The group first spent hundreds of hours reading up on national trends, studying county property statistics, gathering new data on the heights and garages of Old West homes, and taking reference photos. We sought neighbor input and a lot of technical advice from city staff and resident experts. It was immediate obvi immediately obvious to us from the data just how out of scale some of the new homes are, more than twice as large as the current median home. This chart of average home size built per decade is one data example and you can see how the square footage of structures has nearly doubled since the 9th Street, or the red bar, uh, spiked development in the early 2000s. We then distilled the characteristics of outlier uh, properties, which have caused the greatest concern. And we came to understand that the effects of erecting very large structures on our typically narrow, deep lots you can see in these slides that the built structures, um, starting with 33 FAR and above, tend to overwhelm uh, the neighboring homes. They degrade privacy and sunlight. They form long two-story walls along property lines with no landscape buffers. And the accessory structures that have been built recently are way outsized for our neighborhood, which averages about <coughs> 150 square foot per lot. Oversized structures, most importantly, for many people, lead to more off-street par parking pavement, reduced green space, and loss of tree canopy, air, and water filtration. And the aerial view, I would say, says it all. Note the totally paved backyards on the right versus the shaded lawns on the left of that aerial. In summary for me, the MPO proposals we drafted in the fall work as integrated tools to discourage these traits. They're not an emotional attempt to freeze the neighborhood in time. The current revised draft <coughs> presents our best effort at defining the sweet spot 
between maintaining Old West character and scale and respecting property development rights. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Busby, Vice Chair Hyman, and members of the Commission. My name is Simeon Furman, and I live at 2707 West Knox Street. I'm on the board of the Neighborhood Association, and I am a convert to this protective overlay. Uh, when neighbors came to, to my door in 2014 seeking initial support for this NPO, that uh, petition that was mentioned earlier, I refused to sign it. In fact, I, I sent them on their way. Uh, my knee-jerk reaction was that any new zoning was overreach. But over time, I got involved in the community, joined this board, and found more ways to give back. I learned people's stories and realized I belonged to a diverse neighborhood of people with shared interests, all while witnessing this overzealous development. We know Durham is rising and becoming more expensive. I bought this charming little 900-square-foot chalet you all see up on the screen, in 2004 for $91,000. The tax assessed value of this home that I live in is now $259,000. I wish my salary had almost tripled in the last 14 years. <laughs> I probably couldn't purchase my home today at market value. So clearly affordability is diminishing. None of the opponents that I've spoken with personally during this process have described to me the benefits that oversized homes, and thinly veiled high dollar dorms are bringing to Old West Durham. At the core of their concern, I hear self-interest and the desire to protect what they call their investment, not their home. I think we can do better. This MPO is not perfect. It attempts to guide smart, purposeful change that serves our entire community, homeowners, my neighbors who rent, and those who would like to join us. It deserves our support. I thank you and I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Kathy Saylor. Um, I was a member of the NPO working group that drafted the, um, the NPO. I live at 1009 Hale Street. My um, a little background, my parents were both born and grew up in Durham. I was born in Watts Hospital. I have seen a lot of changes in Durham over the years. I live in Old West Durham in a 100-year-old house that I've owned for 25 years. For the um, same amount of time, I've also owned rental property in Old West Durham, including currently five rental houses and two duplexes in the NPO boundary area. I am pleased to be retired from about 20 years of professionally doing custom renovations of old, old houses. I love living in Old West Durham. It's a great place to live, to raise kids, and to age in place. The shade tree canopy is wonderful, and the birds that live there are loud enough to wake you up in the morning. The lots are generally pretty small, so we are all close to our neighbors that we have to interact with. It is a real community. I look at this zoning overlay from two perspectives. As a resident of Old West Durham, who wants to preserve our neighborhood, and as a landlord who wants to have rental income from it. And I think the NPO strikes a very good balance. It prevents developers from overbuilding and profiting at the literal expense of their neighbors, but it still permits owners a generous allowance to improve and enlarge their homes or rebuild a larger house. The NPO allows 2,200 to 3,600 square foot homes, which are ample three and four bedroom homes on small lots. Finally and importantly, it encourages more small separate units by relaxing the ADU rules and allowing 700 square foot units on most of the lots in our neighborhood, additional, um, additional units in our neighborhood. That is large enough for the addition of a one or two bedroom apartment. I think the NPO will encourage the orderly densification of our neighborhood without destroying it. I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Do you mind again, just for the record, your yes. name? Kathy Saylor. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Boo Walukas. I have been renting my home at 905 Rose Hill Avenue in Old West Durham for about three years. I love the charm of Old West Durham. Many, rent, many renters I know want to stay in Old West Durham and hope to buy a house there someday, if we can still find one that's available and affordable to buy. 
But for now, what's important to know about many of us is we live in more than half of the properties in Old West Durham. We are active participants in Old West Durham and part of an engaged citizenry that keeps the neighborhood fun, friendly, and safe. We contribute to the neighborhood and citywide events and initiatives. We pay property taxes indirectly through our rent. We are voting residents of Durham. And many of us support the NPO despite the landlord signs on our lawns declaring opposition. We are counting on the NPO to help keep some of the smaller, older housing units in operation as long as possible. It's the small houses, duplexes, and ADUs that will remain relatively affordable. Thank you for the opportunity to include our voices in this hearing. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Dan Welch, and my wife and I have owned our house at 923 Alabama Avenue since 1998. I'm here to talk about our engagement and consensus efforts, and we are running a little short, so I'm gonna cut through, and because Matt Filter already touched on some of these, the uh, extensive engagement we did, uh, the many meetings and so forth, I'll skip over that. But each time uh, a polling was taken, uh, there was a strong majority that supported the NPO. That's, that's occurred every single time we've taken a poll. When the NPO text was drafted, that majority grew. As Mr. Filter showed, there was a three to one or four to one majority for each of the NPO components. This was after a line by line review of the NPO in a well attended uh, publicly noticed meeting. That was the one he was talking about with over 100 people. Um, and so, uh, and reviewing the listserv, and I know uh, that there's a lot of that in the packet, uh, it may appear there's a significant opposition, and by sheer volume of words, that's true. But it has come repetitively from a very small group of people. When we uh, actually tallied the, uh, the number of unique listserv posters during the month of January, when the listserv traffic was highest on this topic, it showed us uh, that supporters outnumbered opponents by four to one, which was consistent, consistent with what we had seen in the uh, public meetings. Since our first draft in November, we made more than a dozen uh, adjustments to the NPO in response to neighbor feedback. Now the, opponents of the, uh, now the opponents of the NPO have tried to make this a debate about the number of properties opposed. But in a neighborhood that's 75% or 57% rental property, is that really a reasonable standard? The opposition petition you have in your packet represents many properties, but as the staff report indicated, there's only 21 unique sig signatures, and only four of those signers actually live in our neighborhood. One more thing to note about this petition, it was completed in August and September before the first draft of the NPO even existed. And so it's clear that they will be against any neighborhood protection, no matter how modest. So we ask you, is this appropriate? Do our residents, those of us who actually live in our neighborhood, no longer have any say in our future? Have developers really seized that much control over our community? And uh, I have some uh, comments on affordability, but I'll save that possibly for Q&A, because I'm sure it will come up. And uh, I'll pass this on to John Shelp. Um, we probably need some more time if the speaker's willing to cede a minute or two. Well, and before we do that, I. We actually had two sign-ups for the two hearings when folks came in, so I was sitting here eliminating those of you who signed up twice, which you were supposed to do, because there were two different hearings when you walked in the door. Since we combined the hearings, we actually have 12 speaking for, and we have 16 speaking against. And so what I think makes the most sense from here forward is we have had uh, four speakers that have spoken for 12 minutes, if I have that correct. If we can, I would just, we, we said we'd give 30 minutes per each side. If, if we could put the remaining 18 minutes up and we have eight additional speakers, and if you finish early, then that's time that you concede for, to come back if you would like. So budget accordingly, but you, you each have a, a little over two minutes each, and all the people speaking against have about two minutes each, 30 minutes total against. Please go ahead. Good evening, good people. My name is John Shelp. I live at 1022 Rose Hill. I'd like to close out our initial presentation by pointing out that Old West has a history of working creatively and constructively with the city to arrive at solutions that work for our neighborhood and for the city at large. Witness our strong support for the 9th Street District, the higher density developments in the two compact neighborhoods, and for the new developments at Solus 810 9th, Berkshire Irwin Mills, 9th Street North, Station 9 Apartments, and elsewhere. And all along the way, 
It was with the understanding that eventually we were gonna work on an NPO north of Green Street. It, this NPO is not a radical proposal. It's a carefully crafted compromise that balances the competing interests of individual property owners, the needs of the city at large, and the neighbor's desire to protect the character of Old West Durham. It allows for reasonable expansion for property owners. It allows for the addition of more housing units by encouraging granny flats and accommodating duplexes. But at the same time, it ensures that new development will be in scale and in context. And as a result, this development will be more affordable. It's painful to watch in our neighborhood as families are kicked out of their homes, forced to leave their friends at EK Poe, and we watch as their house is demolished and replaced with a mega house with three times the rent. The neighborhood engagement has been thorough and well documented, as you can see in the staff report. In my 14 years as neighborhood president, I've never seen this many meetings and this level of engagement on anything in Old West or elsewhere. Time and again, neighbors have attended our meetings after meetings, working towards strong support of this overlay. It has the unanimous backing of the neighborhood board. We urge you to forward this proposal to the city council with your full approval and thank you for all that you do. Thank you very much, Mr. Ashley. Thank you, I'm Bob Ashley. I live at 3014 Devon Road uh, in Durham. I'm here tonight in my capacity as Interim Executive Director of Preservation Durham. Old West Durham is one of the earliest neighborhoods in the city and is rich with reminders of our history and thus of a significant interest to Preservation Durham. Many houses in the neighborhood are physical reminders of the Mill Village that was so important in Durham's early industrial broom. Gene Anderson describes the mill homes were clean, well-maintained, inexpensive, usually about 25 cents per room per week and convenient. They liked the sociability of the village. They had space in the yards for vegetables and flowers. The nomination of West Durham's listing in 1986 as a National Historic District, part of which lies in this uh, NPO, notes that in Durham alone, Erwin Cotton Mills employed approximately 1,600 people. It's a rich reminder of our past. The proposed ordinance would note that the overlay establishes standards for the Old West Durham neighborhood to ensure that new residential development in company constructed houses, I'm sorry, that new residential development is compatible with the established urban form. Preservation Durham was for, conceived 40 years ago in response to demolitions blamed on disinvestment and urban blight. But the challenges today are more about preserving the character and economic diversity of our neighborhoods, particularly those surrounding our thriving downtown. Local historic districts and neighborhood protection overlays are among the few tools available to residents to help mitigate these effects of speculative development and rising property taxes and values and tax rates. We support every tool in the kit that helps our urban neighborhoods increase density where appropriate without sacrificing the historic character and integrity that makes them desirable places to live. And we fully support the Old West Durham Neighborhood Association and the request for the NPO. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chair, Bus Chair Busby and Vice Chair Harris and Commissioners, my name is Jamie Greener. I'm the current Vice President of the Watts Hospital Hillendale Neighborhood Association. Uh, I've been on that uh, board for about eight years. Um, previous four years, I've served as President. Um, I live at 2410 West Club Boulevard. Um, I'm not in West, uh, West Durham, but just north of it. Um, and I'd like to point out that uh, we are um, we are, as the Neighborhood Association, very much in favor of the MPO. Um, I have a, uh, a motion that we made and have written that I'd like to submit as evidence to the commission. Um, I'd like to add that uh, uh, my house happens to be in the historic district of Watts Hillendale. And so as a contributing structure twice, we've had to go through the process of getting a minor COA to um, do in one case uh, a renovation, in another case necessary repairs, um, and it provides an additional structure to um, our process in dealing with uh, the contractor and dealing with that step, but that I understand that the MPO is different, but people are concerned about the additional burden of that process on staff, and I think that that's something um, that folks should understand staff is willing to work with everybody, and that's not going to be an issue in my opinion. Um, the other thing I want to add is that there's been discussions about concerns about density, and in, in my opinion, 
the issue about density is one that's not going to be addressed. Um, let me restate that. The NPO is uh, my train has left. <laughs> I'm going to cede my time to others. <laughs> And if you don't mind, if you can leave that resolution, you can, you can give that commissioner to Commissioner Alturk on the end, and he can pass it down I will. he's closest to you. And Watts, I'll, he'll, I'll, I'll do better next time. <laughs> Thank you. I think we may have, Thank you very much. We may have this in our, okay. I, yeah, I believe we may have seen that already. If you haven't, there you go. Good evening. My name is uh, Jennifer Justice. I live at 1025 Carolina Avenue in Old West Durham, but I was born in Charlotte, North Carolina, down in, back in 1952. My dad, James Foy Justice, was from Hendersonville, where there is a Justice Street, because my grandfather, James Foy Sr., was a state senator long enough to bring roads to the mountains. Dad was a civil attorney in Charlotte for 50 years. His practice formed around arguing eminent domain cases on behalf of families who were in danger of learn losing their homes. My dad loved the law, and he devoted his work to bettering people's lives. And I introduce myself to you this way so that you might understand that from a very young age, I have known that might does not make right. And that in a functioning democracy, all voices must be given equal value. And so I, I stand before you tonight to speak for some voices who in all the loudness, and I really am sorry for the meanness, uh, might have been lost or not heard. I understand the objections of the opposition, um, perhaps precipitous financial investments, and also political ideology opposed to the democratic liberties expressed by the community through the NPO. I speak for renters who financially support 57% of the homes in Old West Durham. Without us, it would not be there, okay? Like most OWD renters, I settled here because of the small duplexes and single-family homes that made the comfortable neighborhood affordable. These small residences are the reason OWD has sustained a community that is diverse in age, income, and race. And in our city, with our history around issues of race, poverty, and housing, these are not insignificant considerations. The front page of this week's Independent refers to Durham's affordable housing crisis. I do not believe that the best way to address the crisis is to destroy housing that is small enough to reasonably remain affordable. The moment a developer put a four bedroom, four and a half bath, single family home with a one bedroom mother-in-law apartment over the garage next door to me and began charging $750 to $900 per bedroom per month and $1,200 for the mother-in-law, my rent on my modest one-bedroom duplex immediately leapt from 550 a month to 850 a month. The duplex on the other side of me is now being charged a rent of $1,000 a month. I'm an elderly woman living on a small fixed income that I labored my entire life to secure. By late spring, I'm going to be financially forced to leave my home and neighbors of 10 years in OWD. And though I am well supported by friends and by Durham Social Services in my hunt for a home, after six months of searching, there is nowhere for me to go. 
and social services has me on their list of people at high risk of homelessness. I respectfully submit to you my absolute support for all that the NPO can do to uphold the historic identity and core values of Old West Durham. Diversity is not just a word we say. It is a commitment we make, and we sacrifice to that commitment or we lose it. And we may as well not speak the words. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Susan Sewell. I live at 2904 Legion Avenue. I am here first representing Tuscaloosa Lakewood Neighborhood Association Board, being the first neighborhood that went through all the years of work and talk to develop a neighborhood protection overlay. As our um, only neighborhood so far that has completed this overlay, we appreciate the years of work required by this ordinance. We applaud Oglas Durham for, for doing the work to reach an understanding of the special elements of their neighborhood that deserve protection. And we appreciate the efforts they have taken to find a diverse group of zoning tools they hope will protect their special elements. We urge you to support this. I also, as a member of the Inner Neighborhood Council, uh, want to remind you that the Inner Neighborhood Council took a vote in support of uh, this neighborhood protection overlay and of the work that Old West Durham has done. And on a personal note, I wished we'd thought of that backyard tree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine Cupido, and I live um, at 2406 Englewood Avenue in Old West, not in Old West Durham, in Watts Hillendale, and I'm within 600 feet of um, Old West Durham. And uh, the house on Lawndale that you saw pictures of, the giant McMansion, um, is behind my street. That's in my block. And I saw a perfectly fine blue single family home bulldozed down and replaced with this giant monstrosity. And it has two front doors. It has a front door at the back, a front door at the back, two mailboxes, and then the giant garage with the mother-in-law suite above it. And it just totally dwarfs everything. And it just makes me so ha sad. I'm in the historic district, so we have more protections than um, Old West Durham does. And this MPO, while it isn't as strong as the historic district, um, it's the next best step. And I, I so wish that, you know, all of Old West Durham could have been in the historic district when Watts Hillendale did it, because part of the charm of Durham is these old mill houses and the unique architecture of each one. It's not a cookie cutter like Cary. The house that was built is like Cary. If you want that, move to Cary. But Durham is unique. We have the beautiful architecture. Each one is unique and special, and we need to preserve that in our neighborhoods. And... Um, there's been a lot of contention about this with the pro and con, and um, a neighbor in Old West Durham um, pointed out that the MPO process began immediately after the UDO was adopted. During the public meetings and hearings on the UDO, many of the people in Old West Durham wanted a more protective zoning category. The city planning department told us the MPO was the best way to proceed. The conservation began then, and um, as some of the first participants in that process, um, they uh, were assured that um, some of the specific developers and whose properties were not mentioned. The aim was not was to protect the character, affordability, and diversity of the neighborhood, including the modest older homes, and perhaps create an incentive to preserve that character. The city took a very long time to allocate the resources necessary to work with the neighborhood association on the MPO. And while the city fiddled, some of the teardowns and larger rebuilds with their quite exorbitant rental rates do unfortunately serve as models of exactly what the MPO was trying to prevent. But at no point was this process begun against any landowner or set of properties targeted. So um, I, I just share that with you and um, urge you to vote for this. And even though I'm not a resident of Old West Durham, I um, live in, within 600 feet, and a lot of my neighbors in Watts Hillendale, we totally support Old West Durham and their efforts for this um, MPO. And I encourage you to all vote yes. Thank you very much. 
So there are two minutes and 40 seconds remaining for the proponents. I do, and I, I may have missed this, uh, Simeon Furman, have, he did speak. Okay, great, thank you. Everyone is, so, so everyone we have two who minutes and 40 seconds spoken. to hold for rebuttal? Okay, thank you great. very much. Yeah, two and a half minutes, we will, we will hold that time, and we will move to 30 minutes for the, uh, the folks against the proposal, and as we did for the proponents, there's a set of folks who we're gonna bring up in order who have signed up. Uh, again, a total of 30 minutes, so there are 16 individuals who've signed up against, so ideally a little bit under two minutes each if you can, or you can cede your time to other speakers. Uh, and work with me if I get this right. We, we have uh, Mrs. Martin to speak first. And then Mr. McFarling. And if, if you know your order, you can come up and line up. Please, please come and, and speak again your name and your address into the microphone. Great, you may come and speak, please. Uh, if, or if you're first, yeah, please come. My name is Leanne Nelson, and I live at 2404 Indian Trail. I'm a non-resident homeowner in Old West Durham. Over half the property in Old West Durham is non-owner occupied. My small lots are disproportionately affected by the proposed NPO. I am against the NPO. In 2014, a petition to explore an NPO was circulated in Old West Durham. This petition was not brought to my attention or the attention of other non-resident owners. Years later, I learned of the NPO when I received a mailing from the city. Most of the information about the NPO was disseminated on the Old West Durham listserv, leaving out those who do not access that list. Based on information provided by during city planning, I, I noticed that the original petition was circulated with accompanying information clearly stating that the NPO would not affect additions to existing houses. That is untrue for the NPO as proposed today. The NPO petition gained the signatures of 31% of unique homeowners in favor of exploring the possibility of the NPO. Remember, their signatures were given based on misinformation about how the rules would affect existing houses. With signatures of only 31%, the Joint City County Planning Committee allowed the process to go forward in spite of the recommendation that no NPO be pursued without 51% support. The signatures on the original petition represent a small fraction of the total parcels. Since the original petition, the owners of 117 parcels have asked to opt out of the NPO, the desires of the owners of 225 parcels are not known. It is clear that adequate support for the NPO has been lacking from the very beginning. Please vote against the proposed Old West Durham NPO. Great. Thank you very much. I think you're going off of a little different than what I have, so I'm just going to let you keep running with it. You, if you get your folks in order, please come up, and I'll make sure that anyone who's remaining is brought up to speak. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, move me back. Sorry. Move you got it. Back. Move it back. Go ahead, Troy. Yeah, you got to move it back. Uh, my name is Glenn Martin, and I own three rental properties in Old West Durham. Um, I'm I'm here to talk about the survey results from the third and last uh, NPO city planning meeting in November 17th. Uh, this, this meeting had the largest turnout of the 2017 meetings. City planning showed 70% support for the MPO among the participants filling out the 86 surveys. The Old West Durham Board uh, used these numbers at at least the JCCP meeting to say 70% of the 293 unique homeowners support the MPO. Okay? So let me step through the, uh, the 86 forms because only 86 of these surveys were valid. From 86, subtract nine because of duplicate addresses, probably husband and wife, they each filled one. Sorry, unique homeowners. Subtract five because of non-owners. Subtract seven because of addresses not even in Old West Durham. Subtract nine because no address was on the survey at all. This leaves 56 valid surveys 
40 for the MPO, 16 against. So 40 out of 293 means only 14% of the unique homeowners have demonstrated support for the MPO. The survey methodology used is not adequate to form conclusions for the overall support because the sample was neither random or representative. The meeting was stacked with NPO supporters, okay? So uh, they can, so this, anyway, that's my point. No one has demonstrated real numbers. There is no vote, and that's a flaw in this whole system. You've got a, I think it's a minority pushing it through. You're hearing their voices. You're not hearing the majority voice. Please vote against the MPO. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Good evening, commission members. My name is Marty McFarlane. I own 1020 Hell Street, also on 1022, 1024 Carolina Avenue. I've been a property owner in Old West Durham for 30 years now. Um, I had the opportunity, or I have the opportunity, I'm one of the lucky individuals, I have an empty lot in Old West Durham. And in talking with the planning department and trying to do some building on that lot, I found out a lot of interesting facts. And I thank Matthew Filter for kind of cluing me in on how things work in that neighborhood. Uh, the lot that I have is actually 49.75 feet wide at the front. What does that matter? Well, right now, the current regulations, the minimum width of a lot shall be the smaller of the average width of the adjacent lots fronting on the same linear block or the median of the widths of all the other lots fronting on the same linear block. So according to Matt's calculations, the average lot width was around 52 and a half. So really there was no difference between the existing regulation and the proposed MPO regulation. The current zoning rule works fine. Uh, both will require a 50 foot wide lot for me to do something with, okay? That said, he had a caveat in there. You may want to double check your deed and or inquire with the Durham County Tax Assessor. My two lots are thrown together on one tax bill. <laughs> so it looks like just one lot, but it's actually two separate lots. <clears throat> well, I went ahead and spent the money. I spent 750 bucks on a survey and I spent $400 on a title search so I can stand here and prove to everyone that I actually have two lots. They have been designated that way since the surveys were done originally back around 1908, 1911, I think they were, the lawyer said. So thank you, Jesus. No matter what happens with the NPO, I've got a buildable lot. Okay. So that's something to think about. Current regulations are really working just fine. Um, also, um, there's a, another consequence to this. My neighbors across the street have a empty 50-foot lot beside their house. They're going the opposite direction. They're combining the two lots so that they'll have enough room to add on to their house to still be under the FAR. That's taking a building lot out of that neighborhood right there. Once it's combined, it will never be separated again. Um, also, uh, and that's reducing the infill, possibil uh, the infill possibilities. Another <coughs> unintended, uh, unintended consequence, which was so uh, passionately pointed out, rents are gonna go up. Uh, I was told by Pat Young, he was very nice in answer to the email back. I was thinking the NPO would help reduce property values, keep property values low. Uh, Patrick said no, in their observations, usually property values start going up. Well, increase in property values increase uh, equals an increase in taxes, which of course equal an increase in rentals and rental costs that have to go up. And that's why the sudden increase in that neighborhood. Thank you for your time. I am opposed to the NPO. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Howard Sykes. Uh, I've been a Durham resident since uh, 1994, and I reside at uh, 15 Twin Leaf Place. Uh, I have a background in computer science, engineering, uh, and a master's in project management. I've spent decades uh, analyzing data, so I came in to look at some of the data that are in all these regulations and restrictions of the proposed MPO to try to determine how that would affect specifically of whether you could build the neighborhood that exists in Old West Durham if the NPO had been in existence from day one. Uh, I also spoke to Matt Felter a number of times. He was very helpful. Uh, part of, of what Matt told me is he felt that 94% of the properties and he, there was some give or take in that because he said some of the older properties they, they didn't really have uh, exact measurements for. But, but he was starting with the assumption that 94% of the structures 
would be okay. But when I looked at the server and the information that that was based on, I found uh, the residents had only looked at heated square feet, but yet the regulations referred to uh, in the calculation of the FAR, and that was the item that seemed probably most contentious, so I looked at. Uh, it says, well, we're gonna count your garage space, we're gonna count any, uh, any structure that needs a permit that's got multiple walls around it, and we're gonna count ADUs and so forth, but they weren't counted in what I saw that got to that kind of 94%. So we also looked at property records, and at least what's on the web, uh, includes heated square feet, but does not include a lot of other square feet. So uh, through the tax department, they were able to get me the complete property records. I would have loved to have done it for the entire community, but they were sort of limiting how much they were willing to give out. So what we did is we tried to pick a representative street, uh, and the street that we've got uh, that we ended up picking was we picked Alabama, um, we got the records for every parcel on Alabama to do the calculation, including the unheated square footage. Uh, and we found five parcels exceeded the FAR at its current regulation. Now, of course, there's been lots of comments of, well, we've got these new houses and we're trying to prevent new. So I just want to clarify these five houses. One was built in 1911 one in 1919, one in 1922, and two of them in 1930. So I'm, I'm not saying we're talking about the new houses exceeding the FAR as it exists um, in the proposal. Uh, I did end up putting some of the data out early on some servers when it was draft and still not accurate. Uh, I found I got a lot of additional people that told me they were against this regulation, and I, I, there's certainly a lot of people in a lot of different feelings, depending who we want to talk to, but um, we found our number was growing. So beyond the five, the next thing we wanted to do is we took a look, well, how many parcels, and I've indicated here in the yellow, uh, would be able to add less than 50 square feet, because you're certainly not going to do an addition that small, and then even if we, uh, drop that up to 275 square feet. So that's barely more than a single car garage. I think it was noted earlier that uh, the bulk of the homes in this area don't have a garage, so putting a single car garage seemed seem great. A fourth of the homes can't do that. And again, we are talking older homes. So uh, we certainly, or I am certainly of the feeling that this is not a desirable addition and thank you, and we'll defer to the next person. Thank you very much. Uh, and then just as a final comment, 25% of the parcels on Alabama uh, have that very small restriction. Thank you. Hello, Planning Commissioners. I'm Jim Bach. Uh, my wife and I bought our home on 1010 Edith Street in 1962. We raised three fine children, and most of them were educated right there at AK Poe and on to Durham High and into college. We've talked about this NPO rules and regulations, and we just wonder if we can get enough money for our house. Who would want to buy it with all the stipulations that the NPO has that people would buy property would have to deal with? And I just want you to consider that as we have talked about it ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Terry Street, and I am a property owner in Old West Durham. Um, I love Durham, and frankly, I love Old West Durham neighborhood. And I understand how we all need to work together as this beautiful city grows. And there's challenges that are inherent in that. Um, however, I think as you're, you will hear from the speakers that come up, there are varied and reasonable objections to the MPO. Um, it was mentioned early on, there was a deviation from the stated objective, and there has been kind of a flawed process, at least in my estimation, 
where a lot of it was driven through the listserv initial here. There are a number of us who are not active on the listserv. So the listserv was really, I thought, lost dogs and, <laughs> and more neighborhood focused rather than something of this uh, critical nature. Um, the result is a current proposed regulatory overlay that many of us just don't feel we can support. Uh, should it be the decision of the Planning Commission to new, move forward, we've created a representative map where the owners of the parcel on this mock-up of the slide that you see wish to be excluded from the overlay. And I think what you can see from that is there is some disagreement about the proposal as it currently stands. Um, as there is a lot of concern on the opposition side, um, just as there are a number of people are here who are for it, um, a number of folks have taken time to come and be a part of this and in turn around. I would like those who are in opposition to please stand. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Adam Hall, and I live at 2719 Crest Street. Uh, and tonight, I'm here on behalf of the Legislative Committee for the Durham Regional Association of Realtors. I currently serve as the chair. Uh, thank you for everyone being here tonight, and thank you, um, everyone on the Planning Commission, for allowing public input. Uh, I would like to start by recognizing why we are discussing this NPO. The old West Durham neighborhood residents feel threatened by this new development that is happening all over Durham. The root causes of MPOs are increased housing demand as a result of an increasing population. North Carolina is one of the fastest growing states in the US, and Durham, along with the rest of the triangle, is one of the fastest growing areas in North Carolina. As a result, this growth and an increased demand for more housing, neighborhoods are changing. McMansions, as they have been termed, are popping up left and right, and lots are being repurposed to support higher density. I want to be clear that we understand this is troubling to the residents of Old West Durham. When the current residents first invested in this community and bought their homes or chose to live here, this was not the type of neighborhood they saw. We see you and we understand that you're concerned. However, the long-term effects of these protection overlay districts cannot be ignored. People want to live in walkable neighborhoods that are close to fixed amenities, public transportation, and job opportunities. By shutting down the market's ability to meet the demand for housing, the affordability of these neighborhoods will plummet. As a result, would-be residents are pushed further and further out. MPOs serve as an artificial restriction on supply while completely ignoring the demand for more housing in these highly desirable urban centers. If we're going to expand housing options in Durham, we must promote, po we must promote policies that will create opportunities for development and creation of missing middle housing. With this high level of growth Durham is experiencing, these old neighborhoods will have to change in order to keep up with the demand or run the risk of shutting out everyone who cannot afford an expensive old house. Again, I would like to state that we understand why residents feel threatened. However, we can find better solutions that do not exacerbate the housing problem. We urge the Planning Commission to reject this proposed MPO and instead focus on how we can broaden housing options and prices throughout Durham. Thank you. Thank you. My name is John Temple. I live at 1015 Hale Street and I have for 54 years in June. So this argument that it's developers against the neighborhood does not hold water to me because I've lived there all this time. I was born in Durham in Watts Hospital about three blocks away. I learned I love Durham so much that I commuted to Burlington to teach school for 31 years, 68 miles a day. I love my neighbors. I just disagree with some of them right now because I think the NPO is completely unnecessary. In fact, I think it's 
misnamed. It should be a NRO, Neighborhood Restrictive Ordinance, because it takes away private property rights. I don't want to have 67.5% of my land that I cannot ever build anything on, while at the same time I get the pleasure of paying property taxes every year on the property taxes. I bought this house in the 1960s. When I went it there, I rented it for two years for $50 a month, speaking of affordable prices. And houses, when I bought this house, were ten dollars or $15,000 in the neighborhood. But I was a school teacher making $5,000 a year then. So the city thinks my house has increased in value 28 times. So I don't think the increase in rental rates has as much to do with people trying to gouge people rent as it does with the fact that when property taxes increase, in order to maintain their property, landlords have to increase their rent in order to be able to keep the property. Now, uh, I wrote you all a letter. It also went to the city council and it went to the planning board. Uh, so I said a lot in that. You got a letter from me to opt out because I wrote a letter to do that to Mr. Filter and I was told that it was too late because there was a deadline on January the 31st. Well, I'm seldom on the listserv. There was no mailing announcing if you wanted to make a comment about the MPO that we should submit by January the 31st. So that's why I sent you the opt-out letter by email so you could see it. Now, um, I'm watching. A lot of folks nowadays on the city council, the mayor included, talk about the necessity for density and population. I completely agree with them that the MPO will not affect density, but I don't think it will affect it favorably. I think it will affect it negatively, that it will lessen the diff. There's a, they've, someone's alluded to the fact that E.K. Poe is a very popular school right now, and there's lots of young families in the neighborhood. Some of those families are growing, and some of their houses on their lots already are at or exceed the 32.5%. So I think when their kids need more bedrooms, some of them will choose, to, unfortunately, to leave the neighborhood because that will be the only way they can have more space because they won't, under the MPO, if it passes, not be able to ex expand their house. Now... I know, I'm going to say one more thing. I asked someone today, at one meeting I went to, there was a um, mention that we might be able to add additions in our attics that would not count against the FAR. I think it's a very reasonable thing to add that because it does not add to the footprint of the house in existing houses to build into your attic. Um, I was told by someone that, that it was in the ordinance, but I didn't hear Mr. Filter mention that, and so he might be able to answer if you can now build into attics and not have it count against the FAR. Thank you, sir, and that's, I think that's a question we'll be sure to ask. Thank you very much. So just to note, I still have eight speakers signed up who wish to speak against. Not all of them may wish to speak or be here at this point, but just wanted to point that out with 10 and a half minutes left. My so. name is James Wilkins. I live at 929 Alabama Avenue. My mother's in the back. Mom, would you stand up, please? 81 years old. This is the first meeting we've attended where we've actually gotten a say, interestingly, which I, is kind of compelling because we've talked about being inclusive and having involvement and getting feedback. But what you've had is a group of people that were on a mission to get something accomplished and they shut down any opposition against it. My own mother stood up in the last meeting on her birthday in November and she actually had people yelling at her from corners of the room to sit down and shut up. So that's the kind of treatment that the opposition has received. And Mr. Ghosh addressed it and when I went outside at break, I said, if you think you've been on the firing line sitting in that seat, 
you ought to come over and live at 929 Alabama on the corner, because I was the first guy out front that put his neck out and said something's wrong with this process. There's a lot of things that could be said here today. I could churn a lot of butter for you. But let me just touch a couple real quick. Mr. Filter stated that they recommend, for some reason people recommend 51% signatures, not required, but recommend, and they distort the numbers, and they've never been past 29%. So they're not even close to that number, but they will make you believe with their green shirts and their unity that this is a good thing. It's not a good thing. And then the other thing is one lady stood up here and talked about diversity. Well, I can talk about diversity because after being born in a, in a mill house on Edith Street, which would today be in the parking lot of the Harris Teeter grocery store 81 plus years ago, she understands Old West Durham. Nobody wanted to hear her feedback as to how to move forward or a lot of other people in her age range which have a tremendous amount of wisdom. All these people that are pushing this are five, six, seven, eight, ten-year owners, and they're together on it. But there was a lady that stood up here and talked about diversity. About 40, or 50 years ago, not 49, I started EK Poe. I understand what that neighborhood looked like. There were more black people living in Old West Durham then than there are now because these programs have pushed them out. The people have come in, driven prices up, and they're gone. You've had since that time Hickstown, which was a well-established adjacent neighborhood that was predominantly black, is torn to the ground. There's not a house left. I ask you in my letter today, please let the city keep their hands off of this. The folks in Old West Durham know there's signs out saying, protect our hood. We were in that hood, my family, 70 years ago protecting it. And I think we've done a pretty good job. And we'll keep doing that job. Thank you. Thank you. I ask that you vote no. And if you choose to vote yes, then I ask you to shelve it today, go home, rework the paperwork, and make the same rules work in your neighborhood. So I don't mind living under your Durham City rules. Change your neighborhood and live under the same rules. And then I'll come down here and applaud you for it. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. My name is Cyrus Doster. I live at 1002 Oakland Avenue, which is the only property I own. Uh, and I've lived there for the past 16 years. Uh, my wife and I initially supported the exploration and development of the MPO and actually participated in our early interviews with city staff, even handed out uh, meeting announcements. Uh, but we now both oppose it. Uh, setting aside arguments about the elements of the MPO, which I do believe are still too restrictive, my biggest concern is the process through which it's been brought to you. Uh, you've already heard that the proposal goes significantly beyond its early or initial framing of not inhibiting renovation by current owners. Uh, and I share the concerns that have been expressed that the MPO will actually be counterproductive and accelerate teardowns uh, and uh, decrease affordability by limiting the resource of square footage. Surprisingly to me, uh, or I should say, starting at the public meeting in November uh, that the gentleman before me just spoke about, uh, I, I was appalled when I saw decent people with legitimate concerns about the MPO get shouted down by members of the MPO working group. And I found after that point that the, the board and the working group became more secretive about their uh, decision making, uh, and I had information mis misrepresented to me. <clears throat> they seem to have come to a point where transparency with the neighborhood means simply stating what they've done after the fact, as shown by the latest changes that were made after unannounced meetings with city leadership. I and others have been referred to as treasonous simply for asking the working group and board to support a legitimate survey to confirm the majority of support that they claim to have. And tallying emails on a listserv when you know you're going to get browbeated for any opposition is not a legitimate way to gauge, gauge support. The board has rejected that request from multiple neighbors, though in the same meeting that they approved the MPO, they were more than happy to suggest having the neighborhood vote on a new t-shirt design. The same board, who traditionally adds new members in April, is now considering delaying that process, which would prevent new members joining the board who do not share their view of the MPO. Now, after all this, I still believe that the neighbors who have created the MPO have done it with good intentions, but this process and their behavior is not right, and it should not be endorsed by your support of this product. 
Regardless of whether the MPO does end up being adopted by the city council, I ask you to please, please work with the planning department to either scrap or overhaul the current MPO guidelines so that no other neighborhood in our great little city has to go through as much conflict and ill will as mine has. I was unaware of count the criticism that Council, uh, Commissioner Agosh had experienced prior to him announcing that, but frankly, I'm not surprised given the negativity that has, has come out uh, in our neighborhood over this. Thank you for the time. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Jean-Christian Rostani. I've, uh, I've been living for 20, almost 22 years at 918 Carolina. My name be, may be familiar to yours because you've been inundated by a few, by several emails from that bear my name uh, sometimes on, in the signature. Uh, this is because this, yes, this this debate has been quite uh, animated, given uh, the, the outrageous nature of certain certain things that have been going on here. Um, first of, all, I'm going to address two um, two two major points. We are here tonight because several years ago, uh, some people were going knocking on doors asking people to, to sign up for a petition for this MPO on the ground that there, there had been excessive developments going on in the neighborhood, namely by Jeff Munson. Um, I ended up signing it for it, uh, and I now regret it. I feel betrayed. The part of the literature that was going on then about, about, propo about uh, proposing that MPO mentioned that uh, it would only co consist of minor tweaks to the existing zoning. And I'm sorry, I don't think that it's, that's, anybody can claim that the, what the result has been minor tweaks. It has been major tweaks, major, major adjustments, uh, major loss of property rights if this uh, measure was adopted. And, as, and I suggest that I'm no expert in, in administrative laws here, but it seems to me that if you have to qualify uh, with certain, a certain amount of signature and goals and everything to, for, for an NPO process to, to go, the least that that process could do is respect its intent, and the, the intent has not been respected. Uh, and, and so therefore, just on that, I believe that this, uh, this NPO should, should be nullified and at, at the very least uh, been thrown back to, to the drawing board. The, the other point that I wish to address is that, and that's something that hasn't been addressed tonight in regard to the FAR. The FAR is by far, if I may say, the, the most contentious issue in this NPO. We have been told that it's a 32.5% flat. It's not. There is a floor and there is a ceiling to that, uh, to, to that, um, to that, to the far in, in the NPO. Namely, the, the smaller lot can, are, are, are allowed 2,400 square feet to, uh, to build to, up to 2,400 square feet, which result for a 4,000 square foot, you know, 55%. And 4,000 square feet is not even the smaller lot in, 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 in the neighborhood. And, and it, conversely, it results in 30% for, uh, for a 12,000 lot. And this is not even the, the largest lot. There are, I believe, at least 16,000 uh, square feet lot for which it would result into 22.5%. So the far, the NPO doesn't treat any, everybody equally. They are the, the, the creators of, of, the, of the rules have picked, choose, have picked losers and winners. And I don't think that's even that's necessary, nor wise, nor uh, and he can probably cannot even be stand up to to a, to, a, to a challenge in court. Um, and I think that I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, before you begin, I, I know I have a set of speakers still signed up. I don't know if anyone beyond the two of you are are planning to speak. Are there additional folks that have signed up to speak against this who still wish to speak? Sir, if you can come uh, stand in line as well. It's just helpful for us to get a sense of how many speakers are remaining. We have one minute left in the 30 minutes for each side. And so I'd like to extend that, but I, I need to come back to the commission to talk about what's the appropriate way. We always make sure that there's even time per speaker. Uh, so I, I, I open it up to the my fellow commission members. I'm inclined. Is there anyone else who is speaking, or is it just the three of you? I'm inclined to give an additional six minutes per each side, two minutes for each speaker, and that would give the, the uh, supporters eight and a half minutes if they wish to use that time. Commissioner well, Williams? Well, we had a carryover of two minutes and 40 seconds from the other. Correct. So we round that up to three minutes. That gives you approximately one minute each. 
Well, uh, um, and, and what I was saying is we'll, we'll add six minutes. If we give them each two minutes, we'll give six minutes in addition to the, the two and a half minutes that were remaining for the supporters. So that would give them eight and a half minutes if, if they so like. Yeah, I was just um, not wanting to go too far into rebuttal as certain statements have been made both directly and indirectly on both sides. Right. So just trying to get this more to the motion of the commission to carry forward for comments. I'm I'm open to any motions, uh, Commissioner Bryan. <clears throat> I move that we give each side an additional six minutes. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? One opposed. Great. We each, we will give you a uh, seven minute. We can get the clock up to seven minutes. I guess we have one minute left. Thank you. And you may begin, sir. I'm going to help you out a little bit here. I feel like I'm at the Academy Awards. Uh, good evening. My name is Tom Anhut, and I'm the chairman of the Triangle Community Coalition. Uh, we're a group of over 15,000 professionals advocating for pro-economic growth policy throughout the Triangle. We provide guidance to the Triangle's leaders advocating for visionary public policy. Uh, the TCC involves itself in policy decisions at the, in the city and county levels, and for both of these, Neighborhood protection overlays are bad public policy for several reasons. By their nature, MPOs restrict supply by restricting redevelopment. Potential Old West Durham buyers who might have otherwise invested in the neighborhood will go elsewhere, robbing Durham of potential incremental gains in tax revenues. Affordability. Durham adds 20 new residents daily, and the current production of housing units is not keeping up with this growth. As demand outstrips supply, prices increase. The housing affordability issue cascades across all prices of housing and is not just limited to the most needy. There is a growing missing middle in our housing inventory which will continue to grow, made worse by policies such as NPOs. Fortunately, Durham, unlike Raleigh, recognizes the importance of ADUs to housing affordability and, author and allows their use. Those are accessory dwelling units. However, this MPO will severely limit the ability to add accessory dwelling units to Old West Durham properties. This is antithetical to the city's stated commitment to affordable housing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. My name is Rick Emmerich. I'm also a member of the Triangle Community Coalition, and I'd like to continue the discussion on, on why NPOs are bad public policy. From a density standpoint, as a rule, limiting density makes housing more expensive. This MPO will prevent more dense development of the neighborhood, forever limiting the amount of structures. Durham's mayor understands density issue importance, stating, quote, one of the things in Durham that we're going to have to get used to is we need more density. Either we build more houses or the price of housing is going to go through the roof and we need more density, end quote. Old West Durham is very close to the 9th Street District, which will have light rail stop. It's essential that we have high density surrounding transit stops in the city. Property values, owning a home is often the greatest investment in how we pay for our retirement. This ordinance will restrict the type and amount of improvements that can be made in the Old West Durham homes. It's unfair to those who have faithfully invested in the neighborhood. And precedents from a micro viewpoint, if allowed, the use of MPOs will spread as other groups attempt to prevent change to their areas. This has happened in Raleigh, where there are now 19 of what are equivalent to MPOs in Durham. Those areas are forever frozen participating, from participating in the city's growth and have resulted in development occurring further from the city's core, further from transit services, and adding traffic congestion and pollution. A neighborhood overlay is just another way to say no to additional housing to infringe on property rights and limit the use of land and a threat to housing affordability. For those reasons, and on behalf of our thousands of members, Triangle Community Coalition strongly urges MPOs, in, strongly opposes MPOs in general, and this ordinance specifically, we urge you to deny the request. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Waldo Fenner. I live at 1119 Clarence Street. I want to let you know up front, I oppose the MPO. I heard a young lady speak earlier about being homeless. 
Well, I encourage all of you should have been at the tax uh, office or the county commissioner's office when it was raising property tax. That's one of the reasons why you have the high price of homes coming up in your neighborhoods now. I've been in my home since 1994. Walltown has grown tremendously. I oppose anything that infringe on my constitutional rights to have home ownership, to do as I see fit to do with my property. That is why we purchase our homes, to do as we see fit to a certain degree. To limit me the ability to do what I want to my home infringe on my rights. I say that is because the 14th Amendment guarantees us that no local government or state government or federal government should enter any kind of ordinance or laws that infringe on those rights. This does. Again, I would love to see this support when it came down to teachers getting a raise, your children being discounted, don't have supplies, don't have the things they need to perform in schools. As we sit here and debate on whether or not how to infringe on a homeowner's right to have and do what they want to do with their property. So I encourage you to turn this down because it does do just that infringe on our rights as homeowners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who has not been able to speak this evening against? There's a one minute and 17 seconds remaining. And if not, we will allow the supporters to have an additional, it was about nine minutes if you round up, and I'm assuming you will not need the full nine minutes, uh, but we will offer you equal time if the supporters would like to make any additional comments. And then we're gonna close the public hearing, and we're gonna do what we do best, which is deliberate. Yes, I just, uh, my name is Dan Welch, 923 Alabama Avenue. And I just wanted to address a few things I heard um, and just add some clarity to it, hopefully. Uh, first of all, I heard about the initial petition. There were some concerns at that. And I just want to point out that at the top of the initial petition, this is uh, for the application to initiate the NPO, uh, it clearly stated at the, at the top that there was uh, no text drafted at, the, at this time. And the NPO, the, the purpose was to start a process of engagement um, to initiate an NPO and find out what neighbors wanted to add uh, or, or what kinds of protections they wanted to add to the neighborhood. Um, so we, we feel like that was clear to those who were signing um, the initial application. Um, there was a gentleman uh, who tried to minimize the support in the November meeting and said with, the room was packed with NPO supporters and, and it's just like tonight, you know, we put out notices and people show up. We had a good show in here tonight um, and I want to thank the people that did show up. Um, but, uh, you know, our supporters, don't write as much, um, but they show up and they register their uh, their support. Um, they believe that's enough, and so you know, and we feel like it should be. Um, we don't feel like you know it should have to be. Uh, there should have to be uh, pages and pages of emails written and so forth. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, the people, as you can see, showed up tonight just like they have in the past. Um, the far study that chose uh, Alabama Avenue. Um, I happen to live on Alabama Avenue in the, in the block he was talking, and if you'll notice, it's at an angle um, with the rest of Old West Durham. I don't have a map uh, here in front of me, but uh, it is at an angle, and most of the lots on one side of the street are pie-shaped, and they're very small. Uh, that, that block actually has the smallest lot in Old West, 1836 square feet. It's where the neighborhood grocery is. It has like a 68% bar or something crazy like that. But it's because these are really tiny lots. They're very unusual lots. That was not a random choice to pick Alabama Avenue to do a survey and, and show that the, par, the FAR was, uh, try to demonstrate that the FAR was out of line. That was uh, certainly not random. Um, and I want to be clear mostly about this idea that we're anti-density, anti-affordable housing. Um, this, you know, this was never about trying to prevent density. And in fact, you know, we, this, this is uh, an overlay. It's not uh, a complete rezoning taking us out of the RU5 and 5-2 area. We, you know, we didn't uh, attempt to change our zoning so we could get multifamily units in. That's true. We never thought that that was in the realm of what an NPO could do anyway. Uh, but what was available in the NPO 
was to do things that could encourage some additional units. And we took advantage of that by addressing the ADU situation, I think, fairly aggressively. And so we, uh, we, did, uh, we did some studies on how many additional ADUs could be added uh, based on the NPO. Um, there are, it's true that with the, with the lots with the highest FAR, some of those cannot, will not be able to add an ADU. Um, we, we looked, uh, for example, at a 500 square foot ADU. There's about 16% of the lots that will not be able to add a 500 square foot ADU because, because of the 32.5% FAR cap. So there's not enough buildable area. We acknowledge that. But on the flip side, on the other side, uh, by reducing the, uh, um, the square footage, or excuse me, the percentage of uh, heated square feet you need um, to build an ADU, uh, we found that 63% of the lots will be newly able to add a 500 square foot ADU. So we lose 16% of the properties cannot build a 500 square foot ADU. 63% of the properties are newly able to add a 500 square foot ADU. Netted out, that's 47% of the properties uh, that, that are now, uh, will be uh, able to, to add a 500 square foot uh, ADU. That was one of the ways we felt we could affect the density um, situation um, in, in terms of uh, density of housing units. Um, we also have a lot of duplexes still um, in Old West that have not been built on. I think the count is around 120 or 125, and we're fully accepting of those being built out into duplexes uh, and increasing the density in the neighborhood. Uh, all we're asking is that when that happens, it's done in scale with the neighborhood. Uh, the duplexes uh, of uh, before um, 2000, the average duplex square footage was around 750 square feet. I don't have the exact number, but we were looking at that uh, a couple days ago. And the average square footage of duplexes that have been added in the last 10 years, that's 750 square feet aside, the average uh, duplex size that have been added uh, in the last 10 years, are, they're at 1,500 square feet, um, a little bit more than that, actually. And so, you know, this, this is not affordable housing when we're adding these huge duplexes. This is 1,500 square feet per side. They're going for way, way more rent um, than the existing duplexes that are in place. And so, you know, we feel that uh, there's, there's a lot of room to add duplexes and uh, in, in a lot of uh, potential lots that can add duplexes. We just want them to be in scale so they'll be more affordable and they will fit in with the character of our neighborhood. So. Great. Thank Great. you very much. So. That said, we will close the public comment period, the public hearing. I appreciate everyone having come tonight and to share your thoughts. Uh, we will now deliberate as commissioners, and as I said earlier, we may, we will likely direct questions to staff. We may direct questions to some of you and ask you to come up and, and help us make sure we fully understand the, the situation and the votes that are in front of us. So I'll open it up for commissioners. Uh, Commissioner. Uh, we'll start with Commissioner Al Turk and then Commissioner Bryan and Satterfield Warmbuckle. Thank you, Chair. Um, I feel like I'm talking a lot today. Um, I, first, I want to thank everyone for coming, for emailing, sending letters, calling. Um, you know, I know that this has been a very contentious case and that it has caused a lot of tension in the neighborhood, but I will say it at least. In the correspondence that I've had, um, most of the emails have been very thoughtful, both from opponents and proponents. So I, I, I appreciate the feedback, and it has helped me think about some of the issues that are really important. Um, I do also want to thank the staff um, for this great report. I mean, this is the, the report they gave us uh, is excellent. Um, so I will kind of draw on that in, in a couple of cases. But let me, you know. I have, for me, there are three, um, probably more than just three questions, but three broad questions that, I'd, that I'm going to kind of discuss in my comments. And one is, what would this NPO have? What's the effect of this NPO on new construction? Uh, and related to that, second point is, how would this affect affordable housing and density, which has, brought, has been brought up? And third, you know, what are its effects on not just new construction, but the ability of, of homeowners to uh, make re renovations and add to their, to their homes. So you know, a couple of the things, I guess big picture thoughts, is that Old West is relatively dense already, right? I mean, it, what we saw earlier, that it is six to eight units per acre, which is you know, 
more dense than a lot of the, sub, you know, obviously suburban uh, neighborhoods that are less than four, and in some cases less than two units per acre. So um, it is a relatively, relatively dense neighborhood. Um, and it seems, right, from the numbers, it, you know, and, and I'm glad that Howard pointed out that the numbers in some cases are not completely accurate from the, the tax assessor's office because they, they don't include garages and whatnot. But, right, in, if you just include square, you know, heated square footage, 6% seems like of all homes right now are above that 32.5. So that's a, a couple of dozen homes that are above the the uh, proposed FAR, the, all these acronyms FAR and the ADUs. And so the um, proposed uh, maximum floor area ratio of 32.5. So this is, to me, a pretty low number. Um, but having said that, right, it, I, I still wanted to see, it, let's say that this NPO was adopted in, say, 2009. And what, what kind of effect would it have on new construction? And, and I looked, again, at the, at the um, tax records from the county, and it looks like, you know, not including 2017, but there are 13 houses built in Old West Durham, and, and if staff has some, you know, if, if, if anything I say is, seems completely off, please let me know. It seems like there were 13 houses built in Old West Durham since 2010, um, again, based on those county records. Uh, sorry, uh, 13 single family uh, homes and duplexes. Just to put that in context, I looked at all of Durham County, and there were 5,000 uh, single-family uh, homes and duplexes built in that same time. So I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is that this is a very small number of homes that are, that are built, right, um, in all of Durham County, 13 houses um, compared to, you know, 5,000 in the last seven, eight years in all of Durham County. But I wanted to see, of those 13, how many of them would be, have been affected by this NPO? And it seems like by my calculation, seven of them would not have been able to be built. Now, that's seven houses in the last eight to nine years that would not have been able to be built under this NPO. Now, I guess you can cut the numbers lots of different ways. You can say, well, that's 50% of new construction, or you could say, well, that's one home a year that would be affected by this NPO. And I think that's, I mean, you know, and I, I do want to address this density question that, let me see, Tom and Adam and others from the TCC mentioned that, you know, is an NPO a good policy measure, uh, or is it, a, is it bad for density? And it, at least, right, if we're interested in, in affordable housing, we, we do have to consider the supply question. It seems to me that this is a minimal effect on supply, right? Uh, potentially, that this in, right, again, this NPO would have, from what I've seen, an effect on one house a year. And, you know, my assumption is that one house would probably be a little bit you know, someone would build it to be under the 32.5. So that, you know, my, my kind of big, big point on this is that it seems like the supply will be affected very minimally. Um, the second question I mentioned was, you know, is it going to have a, an effect on media, um, excuse me, renovations, right? Can you add onto your home? And again, you know, from the, from the staff report, it looks like the median FAR right now, the floor area ratio, is around 18 to 19 percent of the lot size. That, that suggests to me that 50 percent of houses would be able to add an additional 14 percent of their lot size, right, um, onto their homes or uh, as an accessory unit. You know, if you think about that, right, that's 14 percent of this initial 18 percent. That is, you know, almost an addition of three quarters of your house, right? And, and so, you know, I was, I was thinking about this, well, you know, people, when they do renovations, you know, what, how much do they add? Is it reasonable to add 75% extra? I mean, that seems pretty high to me, right? So I looked, and the National Association of Home Builders suggests that, you know, a bedroom these days is about 12% of your home, a uh, master bedroom. A family room is about 12%. You know, say a kitchen is another 10%. I mean, if you add all of these things, it, it seems to me like under the you know, under the current, or the proposed NPO, 50% of homes would be able to add a considerable amount onto their homes, and 75% um, who are at a 22.5 far or below would still be able to add on a considerable amount to their house, to their house. Again, either on their primary structure or the ADU. But this brings me to what I think is, for me, a, a, a concern. 
and this has come up, the ADU, uh, the uh, accessory dwelling unit. So I'm going to ask staff a question before I, I make this comment. So ADUs, one of the things I noticed in the staff report is we don't have, and this is maybe harder to find, uh, but you know, do you have a sense of how many lots in Old West Durham or even in Durham, you know, all of Durham County have ADUs? And if so, what's the median or average size of those ADUs? So in Old West Durham, and actually some folks in the neighborhood, Barbara Wellinets, where are you at, Barbara, who's been doing a lot of the data analysis, might have it more at the tip of her fingertips than I do. But I would venture to guess there's maybe a dozen at most ADUs uh, in Old West Durham. Okay. Uh, most of them are new construction. Um, there's yeah. one developer in particular uh, who has a, a, an ADU model, and they seem to be similar size. My understanding is it's about 733 square foot square feet unheated ground floor garage. And there's usually a, roughly a 733 square foot uh, accessory dwelling unit above that. And that's been replicated several times. Um, I don't know off the top of my head how many, though. So that would be 1,500 square foot feet added, right? And so, and, th and that is based on, or the max at least, right now under, in the, under the UDO is 30% of the primary structure. Is that right? So the oh. accessory dwelling unit in that example would be capped at 30% uh, yeah. under the current no. regulation, not right. the garage. Not the garage. The difference is under the proposed NPO, there are some trade-offs. Um, they are bumping up the heated square footage to 50% versus 30% right. where it is now. Right. Uh, but they are also now counting that in the FAR and capping it at 700. Right. So there's a, there's a little bit of a trade-off there. Right. I think Mr. Welch's point earlier uh, see, seems accurate. I don't have the data in front of me that you are essentially taking for folks that are near or at or above the 32.5 that are eligible to add an ADU, um, they will no longer be able to do so. But that is a relatively smaller population than the folks at the other end of the distribution who maybe have an 1,100 square foot house. 30% uh, of that is you know a little more than 300 square feet, not a very market viable ADU. Bumping that up to 50% then allows them to go a little bit higher and maybe have a more market viable unit. I don't have the data in front of me. That's just kind of first blush off of what I've heard tonight and some of the data I've seen. Okay, thank you. So, and that, and that last point is what I was getting to, right? I mean, there are a, number, a considerable number of homes that are relatively small that, you know, are at 18% far right now, maybe 20%, which means they can add another 12.5% of the lot size, right, as an ADU. And so my, you know, my, or my concern is if there is room to build a, an ADU and it falls within the FAR, why restrict it to only 700 square feet? I mean, that, you know, to me, right, if you, can, if you have a 2,000 square foot home and rather than adding on to the primary structure, you say, well, you know, maybe I'll build a 1,000 square foot or 900 square foot ADU that, rather than being an efficiency, it can be a two-bedroom or something. That, that, I mean, to me, this potential restriction of 700 square feet, I think, may have a, a more negative effect on affordable housing than the FAR. Because as I've shown, I think the FAR, just based on the numbers, does not seem to affect the supply that much. So, um, so I guess, I, I, don't, I don't know if to the proponents, if they would like to address, you know, kind of answer this question of, you know, why does the ADUs cap at a 700 square feet and, could, you know, could that be changed? And then to any proponents who are kind of concerned about ADUs, you know, is there something about the ADU provision as it is written right now that, you know, if it was changed, you could support it? Thank you. Let, let's just start with bringing up the propo one proponent for one minute. A commissioner has asked you to come up as, as part of their time. And if you can directly address that question, please. Dan Welch, 923 Alabama Avenue, and uh, as I recall our discussions around the ADU, the 700 square feet, uh, we converged on that from a number of directions. First of all, there was a, a major concern, as we showed in some of the slides earlier, about oversized uh, uh, accessory structures that overwhelm. They're very, they can be allowed to be set into the far back, way up against the uh, end of the setbacks, and they tend to loom over backyards. They're two-story affairs that, um, with a lot of square footage. Um, and so there was 
a lot of I think there was general consensus of a lot of people that we needed to do something about minimizing the uh, the accessory structures, and so we looked at what would be appropriate to do. And I think we actually homed in on the 700 square feet. I believe uh, uh, going back and thinking about that, uh, partly because there's a viable business model coming in. Several of the ADUs that have been built, in fact, maybe the only I don't, Matt said 12 units or so. Probably half of those have been built in the last uh, few years. Um, as these carriage houses where the ADU is 733 square feet. And so it seemed like 700 square feet was kind of a good, a good number because that's what the market was demanding. That's what they're able to sell. And that would kind of meet our objective of not having these overly huge accessory structures on the back lot lines looking over into people's backyards and, and so forth. So that, that's, I think, largely where it came from. Great. And Commissioner Alturk, if you want to bring up one proponent or a opponent to answer your second question, and then we are going to have to move sure. to some of the yeah. other commissioners. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Thank you. And one minute as well, please. Jean Christian Rostani. I, uh, VADU, thank you for, for, for bringing this up because I do think that the, the, the restrictions of the, on VADUs are, is one of the weakest points of, of the NPO. Um, as a matter of fact, if, you, if, 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 the, if the object was to, 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 to prevent excessive development, this could have been achieved by just increasing setbacks and preventing from overpaving the back of a lot. Instead of that, because, because the, the proponents wanted to restrict developments overall, they, they brought all kinds of measure, measures that, that stiffen creativity and, and, and prevent people to decide for themselves what they want to do. And this ADU question is, is a, a, a perfect illustration of it. They want to decide for homeowners whether they want to have a huge dwelling or, 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 use, or use their allotted far uh, and, and, and balance it between, between a, a main structure and an ADU. And I think that's one of the, 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 the weakest points of, of the current proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any uh, closing comments? Sure. I, I mean, I will say one more thing. Um, yeah, I, there's been a lot of, so I, I've tried to address two questions that have come up a lot. There's another one that has been brought up, which is about the process. Um, again, it, it seems like it has been a contentious one, and I have heard both good and bad about the process. And so, at least for me, I cannot make my decision based on that because it, it it, it's hard for me to assess whether it was, you know, was it a perfect process? I doubt it. Was it a terrible process? I also doubt that. Uh, so I'm going to just, you know, kind of base it on the merits of the NPO, and I, and I do appreciate all the comments, but I, I cannot make the uh, decision based on the process itself. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Bryan. Thank you. I also want to echo Commissioner Al Turks. Uh, thank you for your attendance tonight, your thoughts, your input via email, and so forth. Uh, I do regret that the process seems to have become contentious. Another thing that seemed to come out to me tonight during the comments was that the process of communication within the neighborhood may have relied a little too much on the listserv. And people who don't go online uh, don't use listservs and stuff, and I happen to be one of them, uh, I left out, and had I been living in Old West Durham, maybe my wife would have figured out what was going on, but I might not have. Uh, anyhow, I have several comments and a few questions. I'll do the comments first. I want to actually start with the Knight Street plan, which was adopted in November 2008, and in the Knight Street plan, which created the Knight Street compact neighborhood, part of which is immediately south of Old West Durham, it is acknowledged that the residual, the residential mill village, which is what it was called in the Knight Street plan, could really experience uh, pressure from being adjacent to the compact neighborhood. And it also noted that one way the neighborhood could protect itself is with a neighborhood protection overlay, which was a new tool in the box at the time. It just took a long time, it appears, to actually get around to trying to do one. And during that period of time, which is not quite 10 years, it seems like a lot has happened, some perhaps for the good and some not so good from the perspective of the neighborhood. Uh, some comments on the draft. Uh, it goes, uh, I have concerns about some of it. I can understand the use of the FAR 
to regulate bulk. I think Chapel Hill does it, and I think they use even a lower number. Uh, but it, I do sympathize with one gentleman who pointed out that it doesn't quite treat everybody equally. Uh, if I owned a 12,000 square foot lot, uh, I would be able, should be able, if you followed the FAR, to have something like 3850 square feet of building, but they cap it at 36. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that bothers me a little bit. Uh, I understand how they are regulating or trying to regulate the height. But what bothers me here is that we seem to have adopted a position that one height fits all. And I don't agree with that. I think if you own a larger lot and can afford to give more setback, then you should be able to build higher if you gave some setback. One thing I suggested to some of the uh, proponents was maybe one foot of additional height for two additional feet of setback. Uh, and I also think that the setback proposed for the accessory structure rather than just jumping up 10 feet, when you get over 16 feet, I, I suggested that that be a gradiated thing. And on the subject of trees, uh, the requirement of a backyard tree, I, I think the concern here is tree replacement where people have maybe come in and cut down the trees to build a larger structure. But it doesn't really say that. And when you state that, you know, this seems like it would apply to any lot in Old West Durham. That's a concern to me because you may have some elderly people living in Old West Durham on fixed incomes who uh, just so happens they don't have a canopy tree back there. And to be told that they would need to put one in is an expense that I don't think they would want to look at. Uh, and the other consideration that comes in, if you look at section 8.3 of the UDO on trees, what you see is that developers are given a certain uh, credit in terms of square footage for trees that they plant. And for a two inch caliber, caliper canopy tree, that credit is 175 square feet. And if you're hoping that that two inch tree that you plant might grow into a four inch tree, you really need to allow about 275 square feet. And I bring that up because somebody who maybe has built a McMansion uh, and you want to see a tree back in, in the backyard could maybe hire an arborist to come in, look at the property, and come back and tell you that there's not enough room for a tree. So then what are you going to do? And I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, the other thing that struck me about the tree is that you're obviously concerned about your tree canopy, but there's nothing in here about tree preservation. I think if you're gonna to try to manage your tree canopy, you need to encourage tree preservation as well as tree replacement. And you seem to only be focused on replacement. To me, that's a flaw. Uh, and now I have some questions for staff. One thing that I see is this lot dimensions, uh, maximum lot area, minimum lot width, and so forth. When exactly would that apply? I'm just pulling up a copy of the NPO, so just bear with me for one moment. So that would apply. Uh, with an attempt of subdivision or lot consolidation. Okay, so it's only if somebody comes in and buys up properties and wants to resubdivide? Exactly, yeah. That, I think that there's pretty limited cir circumstances where something like this uh, might occur, uh, but it, and I don't want to speak for the Neighbor Association, perhaps someone can volunteer to follow up on this, but 
um, kind of pre preventing against large scale redevelopments where someone buys a few blocks and wants to consolidate and kind of tinker with the, the lot sizes under existing zoning. Okay. Um, would the maximum lot area requirement prevent somebody who is presently a property owner who owns two adjacent lots from combining them if they would get a lot that was over 12,000 square feet? Yes. That to me, again, is a provision that I'm uncomfortable with because if I were a property owner living in the neighborhood and you told me I couldn't combine two of my lots, I don't know whether I'd win or not, but my response would be, I'll see you in court. <laughs> I would say, and I don't, again, I don't have all the data handy with 428 parcels, but I do think there's a very, very limited set of circumstances where there are two people that have uh, properties contiguous with one another uh, who might be interested in doing that. Perhaps the Neighborhood Association has more comment on that, but your point is taken. Okay, well, if I may, Mr. Chair, I would like to get the Neighborhood Association to comment on this uh, maximum lot area and how many lots... How many possibilities there might be for combination by current owners? Commissioner Bryan, you, you may do so, but we will want to limit time if each commissioner does wish to speak. So if you can address the, the question, then we can bring up one individual for one minute. Uh, how, many, how many properties are there in Old West Durham where two lots side by side owned by the same owner if combined would yield something that's 12,000 square feet. Does anybody know? If, if, someone, if someone does have the answer, please come up to the microphone and you may answer the question. 